So what are we going to be doing? We're, gonna, we're aiming here to do 10 classes. We're aiming to have two chapters in each class. Uh, we have met. Welcome. We have met, and we will always meet on Wednesday. Uh, class starts at 6 p.m.-ish, right? There's an ish there, because coming not at 6 p.m. sharp is totally okay and acceptable. If you are in work or you are in traffic and you're going to be 15 minutes late, still come. It's not a problem. It's very casual. I'm wearing flip-flops. <laughs> uh, uh, class ends before 9. This is a C-Panel. Uh, we have to have a C-Panel employee here to shut this thing down. Uh, I am not a C-Panel employee, so we are out of here at 9. What do we do after 9? We don't stop. We go somewhere else after 9. Previously, we went to Cedar Creek. Then we went to Taco Cabana. Then we're now we're going to a pho place. So if you are down for pho, or pho, if you know how to pronounce it correctly, which I do, but I fail at, uh, we go to a place called uh, Simply Pho, and you know, grab yourself pho. Ed? I believe it's actually called the Flying Pho. That's right. <laughs> that is a correction. <laughs> I sometimes go to a place called Simply Pho. It's on a different side of town. The place we are going to is better than the place I normally go to. It's called Flying Pho. That is, thank you for that. And by the way, that brings me to something else that we always get questions about, which is how do we operate a class? That is exactly the right way to operate a class, right? If you have any questions at all, you raise your hand, you stop me, and then we can have a discourse and a discussion. You don't have to keep raising your hand because that's awkward. Uh, but that's a great way to like, you know, transition there. And you're free and welcome to do it anytime. Don't wait till the end. Uh, okay, so on all of the events for this class, I told everyone if they don't have Python installed on their computer and an ID up and running, come beforehand and we'll be happy to help you out. We'll get that all set up for you. Uh, of course, that never happens, right? You tell people before class come for preparation and we had five people show up or something like that. Certainly not everyone here has an IDE and has Python installed. If you don't, we will help out. We will make that happen. Uh, we will not make it happen during class. So catch us after class or come to Flying Club and we'll, we'll help you out there on your laptop. Uh, if you don't have it set up and you're not in an environment, you don't have all that stuff worked out, I will tell you this, or if you want to use someone else's computer, your computer, the dog eats or whatever, uh, there's codepad.co, right? This is really cool. We're going to go over this in class a little bit. I'm going to show you it because it's what they call a web IDE. And a web IDE allows you to write code without actually installing all the stuff that you would otherwise need to do to write code. Web IDE is a specific thing. It's explosively popular in some places. Uh, and it's a great way to really quick demonstrate something. You know? Or if you're not on your computer and you want to show a friend, you know, this is what we can do. You can pop open to one of them. They have a really, really strong use case. OK, now today, what are we going to be covering? We have two chapters today. Two chapters and a sliver, because I'm going to cover chapter zero, too. There's something I wanted to point out. So uh, the two chapters are Python Basics and Flow Control. Those are the names of the chapters. I really think it's just Python Basics, but that's what we have here in the, the, the index. So we're going to go over them. I'm going to, we're going to look at all of the material in the class, at least when I'm, you know, we may change and do things differently. Uh, for future classes, I intend to solicit more and more external material outside. For this class, I spent about two hours trying to find material outside, and to be honest with you, the material is just, it's, it's a little basic, and there's not enough people covering it. I do want to cover one thing, though. I think external material is very important. I will emphasize that when I think it's better than what the book offers. And I think the help and the documentation that Python offers is extremely important. So this is one of the things that I can really like. This is industry expertise and practice. I'm going to drill into people's heads how you get help from Python itself, not on the web, not on the book, how you can actually use the Python tools. And if you've taken either one of the other two classes I did, you know how to do it in JavaScript and in Python. It's definitely something we hit on all the time. OK, so the first thing I want to hit on is external material, right? This class, we're using this free book. The reason we, we, we looked at, when we look at curriculum, really the number one thing that is the first filter is, is the book free. The book's not free. I can't have a big class with a bunch of new friends that do it because everyone says it's a $30 book. It filters out a lot of people. It's an introductory class. This book is totally free. You can go online and you can read it. The last book we did is totally free. You can go online and you can read it. Uh, really quick, let's just take a look at the name of this book so you know, we kind of have an idea we're all on the same page. 
The first book we did was called Think Python. The second book that we're going to be doing now is called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Does anyone want to tell me what the, they feel about these names? What, what does it read into it? Automate the boring stuff. What does that mean? What are we getting ourselves into? Anyone ever automate anything boring? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. So automate the boring stuff is a very, very practical book. What we're going to be doing in this class is giving you actual job skills, skills you can use wherever you're working. This is not going to be a thorough dive into Python. It's not going to be a computer science course. We're going to go over the stuff we need to know. But just keep in mind that the aim of this book is to do precisely what Dan said. Right? We're going to cover some spreadsheet stuff. We're going to cover some web stuff. We're going to cover some real practical things. And one thing you will not be asking when you get out of this class is, what can I do with Python? Right? That's, that's what this book is all about. This is showing you what you can do with Python. OK. So uh, I wanted to cover uh, external things we can reach out to outside of this curriculum too. MIT has on open courseware, they call it uh, six dot three zeros and a one. That is an insane numbering system, but that's how they do it. And this is an introduction to computer science with Python, right? So we're covering the practical stuff, Python-y. You want to learn the actual computer science stuff? You want to get more into that side of it? Look at this MIT, you know, six and three zeros and a one thing. Right. This is it, this is very popular in these types of courses now. Uh, they they do a reasonably good job curating them. I myself am playing around with the Harvard course, and I'm thinking about helping out Houston and throwing a study group on that too. Uh, check it out. You know, I, I can't. I've never done this one, but this is out there. It's pretty popular, and I believe they actually for like two hundred dollars give you a certificate when you take it. So you can actually say you have a certificate from MIT. Right. Yes. One thing actually. This. Book and when I looked up on Udemy, they actually, I guess the guy that wrote this book has a Udemy course you can uh, buy for 10 bucks. You would like to see this author go over his own book. That is a very, very good point, too. That's that's also a very valid point. And I think he also has a free YouTube. I think it's all on YouTube as well. Oh. Is it, his name is Al? Al Schweiger? Yes. Yeah. I think it's all on YouTube. And let's also make note of that, and, and I'll say it here again, because we want to promote the author for giving us this awesome book. The author himself sells a Udemy course, which goes through the book and teaches you Python. If you want to have the author's instructions rather than mine, or, no, I don't both. know why you want that, or both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or both, you really, 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 really love this book, and you want to do it twice, once with me and once with the author, uh, then the Udemy course is definitely a way to go, and I, and I think it's a totally affordable option. Uh, Udemy, edX, Coursera, all of these guys are out there. They're all doing the same type of thing. They're providing curriculums. And yes, this one actually has a curriculum by the author. Check it out. We appreciate him providing us the book, so I don't have to write that. And yes, it's uh, are you doing that course? Yourself? You're not I, I went ahead and I just saw it this afternoon, and I went ahead and signed on partly, mostly to support the guy. What was the cost? If you ten, ten bucks. Ten, there you go, ten dollars. So that's like what? Two beers, a beer and a half, whatever. <laughs> Coffee, maybe a latte, one, maybe half of one at Starbucks. Yeah, check it out. Uh, so does, by the way, does Fa have beer? Yes, that's the oh, okay. well, you know. yes, If you do like alcohol, that, that, that's going to be the last question we take on the fuck place. If you do like alcohol, it is BYOB. Uh, oh. But there's plenty of us that go there and drink coffee, and we won't be that worried if you join me in that. Uh, okay, so we finished with the slides. That is all of the PowerPoint -y stuff you'll have today, so <laughs> sit back and relax. We are now going to hit this, this book, and what I wanted to do is uh, Chapter Zero. How many people have read Chapter Zero? It was in the, the okay. That's promising, right? More than half. <laughs> Chapter zero tells you what you're getting yourself into, right? So uh, what I like about chapter zero, and I'm going to tell you this, because this is worth stressing, especially for the other half of the class that haven't read it. Uh, computer programmers have, in some people's mind, a real reputation with being very mathy, right? And I don't know a nicer or worse way to say that. I just would say mathy. And that means that they like, these are people that understand math and enjoy math and do math all the time. But a lot of computer programming isn't math. It's like business concern, right? And it's important to make a note of that because for those of you that haven't taken calculus, like me, it's totally fine. You can be a successful computer programmer, right? Uh, 
There's nothing wrong with that. And that's what this book goes over right here. You know, this is the one takeaway that I really have in this chapter zero. He hits the nail on the head. Programmers don't need to know that much math, right? When you're building a website, you're not going to need to know that much math. When you're making an input form, just it's useful in some areas, but it's not useful in all areas. Come on in. Uh, so this book will be less mathy than the last two books that we did, and I'm a huge fan of that. Okay. Uh, so one of the options that we have here is the author provides, on top of the Udemy course, YouTube videos, right? I think we should watch some of those YouTube videos, at least hit it off and see how it works. We're going to play with the format of this class too. Uh, and I'm going to take this YouTube video and we're going to speed it up just slightly, but we're going to hit it. It's 10 minutes long and I'm going to see if we can do it here. Let's see. It's a little slower. We'll see how it works out. Okay. There we go. Okay, that's way too fast. 1.5. The course name is described how to start IDE if you have Mac or Linux. IO has two parts, the interactive shell and the input on file. So we're going to talk, he, he doesn't quite give this uh, a very big introduction to this video. There are different ways to evaluate code, right? How many people here have run idle, played with it at all? Okay, so idle is what we call a REPL. Let's go ahead and hit that, let's talk about idle. Uh, what he means here when he's, when he's jumping into idle is that when we run this idle, it comes up like this. This is what they, they call it, this is what it is. It's like a graphical, semi-graphical interface, right, into Python. And it pops up <coughs> open a window, and it gives you the ability to type Python code and then immediately get an output back. So the author is going to show you this. You run idle, you can say something like 5 plus 5, right? And it immediately tells you what the return of that is, which is 10. And here's the thing about idle, and I think I found this out the last time too. You actually can't make it bigger. Just super annoying. You make the text better. Well, Well, if you're idle, maybe you can now. Hold on. And you have yes, the there we go. Okay. Because you can just run Python. Well, it's the GCC. Uh, the GCC, where do you, where did you see that? You got 8.2 so right there. I, I so got yeah. 6.3 on my lab. That's just saying what version it was compiled with. So when you, when you want to make your own Python, you use a compiler, a C compiler, and that's just referring to that. Yeah, it doesn't matter, essentially. Uh, but the takeaway from this is, is that idle provides you the ability to write Python code and test it. So if you're, you're getting down into your tasks and you want to say, is this valid Python? How do I do this? You can use idle to figure those types of things out. I'll give you a great example. Python has, he talks about this in the first chapter, and we're going to hit on this. It has two different types of integers. It has an integer and it has a float. Right? So if you take this and we say something like 10 divided by 3, Right? What you're going to get back is 3.3333, so on and so forth. That's the number. Python has another thing where you can do 10 divided divided through, right? this double divide sign. And then you just get back 3, truncates it down, treats both of those things like whole numbers, and it has to produce a whole number. It drops the remainder. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. When you're starting off, you're going to forget things like this. It's the only reason why I'm talking about it. Forgetting is normal. Unforgetting, idle is very good at that. Unforgetting is playing. Jumping into idle and trying it out and seeing, you know, oh, that, that's right. The single one, it gives me the numbers after it, the fractional part. The double division thingy, that drops it. When you forget which one's which, here's your solution. Oh, okay. that forces it. That, that. So if you said, like, x equals 10 slash slash 3, the x type would be an integer then. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. Okay, uh, but the takeaway here isn't the math part. The takeaway is the forgetting part. This is the solution for forgetting. It's a, it's a quick way, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll get into the math. Just hold on. Uh, okay. The file editor rule here. The interactive shell runs here, Here's another takeaway from this, right? He has, he has in his file editor, anyone know what that file editor is? 
title? Notepad. 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 Right? So the author of this book is actually writing code with Notepad. I don't advise doing that, but uh, I would say this. Uh, the point is that you can do that. It doesn't matter how good you are. You know, you, If you don't want to be pretentious at all, yes, you can just write this stuff in Notepad. He's actually writing all of his code in Windows Notepad. Something I've almost never seen. I think it's really awesome. One at a time shows you results immediately. It's great for just experimenting and seeing what he's talking to do. The file editor lets you enter Python code between programs. There are other editor apps for typing in Python programs. I use one called Sublime Text, and there's another one called Python. But this course will use Idle because it comes with Python, and there's no additional setup to do, and because it's the same across Mac, Windows, and Linux. Okay, that's all true. I will be using PyCharm, right? <laughs> And I'll tell you why I'm going to use PyCharm. We're going to get into that a little bit more. The downsides to I.O. But I do suggest people get an editor. If you came here earlier, we'll set you up with PyCharm. That's my go-to for teaching Python because it is the simplest thing to use. Come on in. Uh, it's very, very, it's very simple to use PyCharm. <coughs> okay. Uh, really similar, so it's We're going to skip forward a little bit here. Here we go into the expression. Place 2 plus 2 and then press enter. In Python, 2 plus 2 is called an expression. It's the most basic kind of programming. Can everyone hear this? Are we no. having difficulty hearing this? No. Not good. Not good, OK. Not good means I'm going to stop doing it entirely. And we'll, we'll solve the not good part for the next class. Uh, here are the authors going into expressions, right? And we're going to go back to the material then, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, when we hit this chapter up, chapter 1, the author is literally just showing you this, right? And we can do it, too. We don't have to have the author's YouTube video to do it. He shows you right here 2 plus 2, and then the result is 4. Now, you can do this in any which way. You can do it with idle if that's the way you want to give it a shot. We'll come over here. We'll show you our idle. We'll do the exact thing that the author is doing in his video. 2 plus 2, we get back 4. Right? That 2 plus 2 thing, there's got to be a name for it. In English, we don't usually have a name for it. It's just something we do. Computer programmers have a name for it. It's called an expression. Right? An expression is something that you can evaluate to get a result. And you can have multiple of these things that you have to do, and they give you back a statement, right? So an expression, you can kind of think of that for right now as just part of a statement, or a statement in and of itself, right? We're going to go over that a little bit more. The book is going to be a little bit sloppy. It sloppier. gives you a statement that is the, the, evaluate, the result of evaluating an expression is a statement? The result of evaluating an expression as a statement. You said it gives you a statement. You said that it can be part of a statement. Right. That's what expression. The expression is a subset of, of a statement. Of a statement. That's right. Yes. But this gets pretty confusing for the beginners. Can you say something about statements yes. in the same general way? So a statement, if you want to think of it like this, a statement is uh, one instruction to Python. Right? Now you can break that up inside and it can do multiple different little things, but you can just think of it as like one thing that Python's going to be doing. It's going to look at your statement and say, I'm going to do that now. Right? And if there's a problem, Python's going to come back and say, this statement caused the problem. Ed? So there's a parallel in the early days of writing computer languages to English. And this parallel is not an exact parallel. But the idea is that a statement would be like a sentence, whereas an expression would be like a clause. Oh. Can you wow. say that again? A statement would be like a sentence, whereas an expression would be like a clause. Part of the sentence. Yep. Come on in. Let's see. We've got one right here, Jared. Uh, we've got one over there, too. Yeah. There there one. Oh. Uh, Thank you. So that's definitely what, now these types of like uh, metaphors, they, they have they, they have mileage on them, right? You can go so far with them and that's perfectly fine. I actually like that one. I don't have any complaints with it. Uh, it gets a little bit more complex when you say that uh, an expression can be a, a statement in and of itself, right? Uh, so yes, but th th that's perfectly fine. So when we get down to it, he shows here that he can just give it two, right? And Python will evaluate that two and return itself, right? So he says here that that 2 could be thought of as an expression. It's an expression that does nothing except return itself. You can take that so far, yes. Uh, I will also say this, because I don't want to have to keep saying you can take that so far. Uh, this book 
tells you a lot of things that are wrong and then corrects them very soon after. You're going to stay in the class the whole 10 weeks, so everything's going to get corrected. So I'm just going to stop and drop and dropping those caveats. Uh, so uh, what could an expression be? Well, with math, an expression could be something exponented, right? Uh, exponentiation, I suppose, for math people. You could say something like 2 raised to the power of 2. That is an expression, right? You could say 5 plus 5, an expression. 5 divided by 5, an expression, right? Here's where he has those two things we just used, the integer division and the division, which I use as something that often confuses people that you're going to want to look up somewhere. We'll get more into that. But you can always test that out with either. Uh, multiplication, subtraction, addition, all of these types of things. We take one integer or one number and we do something to it with another number. That is an expression, right? Python's going to go out and do that. Now, it gets down into the question of, OK, well, this thing that we're doing, what makes this so special, right? What makes the Python operation so special with these addition, subtraction, multiplication? OK, no matter how bad your math is, how many people in here have heard of PEMDAS? OK, PEMDAS. Oh, yeah. OK, everyone's hand pretty much goes up, right? PEMDAS is whenever you work with math, right, you have to do things in a specific order, right? You can't add before you multiply. you got to multiply first. You multiply and divide at the same time, then you add and subtract, right? So if we take it, I'm going to show you an example of that. If I say here, uh, 5 plus 5, I get back 10, right? But if I say 5 plus 5 times 2, what am I going to get? 15, right? Why do we get 15? Why don't we get 20? Who wants to hit on it? Dan. Because the multiplication operator is evaluated first. Precisely. Multiplication is evaluated first. So what does that mean? That means when you have an operator, multiplication, subtraction, division, when you have something like that, Python sees it. The first question Python asks itself is, what is the precedence of this operator? Right? What is the precedence? And that means what comes first? What has a higher priority to Python? And math doesn't all have the same priority. Different operators have different precedences. Now, you could have done this, right? 5 plus, in parentheses, 5 times 2, right? Going to do the same thing. Because we're saying multiplication comes first. It's implicit in the first. It's explicit in the second. Can everyone in the back see this? So I'm going to make this bigger? I, I can probably make it bigger, which means I will. Uh, let's come on here. OK, we do that. There we go. Okay. Uh, the only thing that stinks about that is it's at the bottom of the screen. Let's see if I can help that out too. There we go. Okay. We're gonna have to ignore my my commie tux at the very bottom. Of that. Uh, okay. Can, can we see that? Can everyone in the back see that? All right. Okay. So what we have in the first one here is we have no parentheses, and I call that implicit. That means that when you have no parentheses, that operator, that, that multiplication sign says, hey, hey, Python, do me first, right? Python goes out, it does multiplication first, then it does the addition. That's part of what we call in computer programming operator precedence. Operators have a defined order in which they're evaluating. In the second one, we have parentheses. Those parentheses don't change anything. So it's just being explicit. You're just telling Python, hey, I know you would otherwise do this thing first, but let's be sure you do it first and do parentheses. Now, here's actually what's happening. Parentheses to Python have the highest precedence. You see parentheses in Python? Python's going to do whatever in those parentheses first. It's not going to actually look at it. It doesn't care what the plus sign is or the, addition, the, the multiplication sign. And the embedded ones first. What's up? It's going to do embedded parenthetical things before it does the ones in which. That's exactly right. We're going to get to that too, but not right now. The, it works from the inside out. Okay, so uh, now let's let's also when we were talking about this, uh, we're going to look down here, and they're they're showing you the precedence piece, and they're just going over the very that very same thing, right? That the multiplication is going to come first. You can override it with parentheses, change it entirely, uh, and that's that is the only special thing to an operator, right? So if you know that, you know the only gotcha for an operator. An operator takes arguments 
just like you'll find functions do later. Those, those arguments are usually on both sides of the operator. And then what it does is it evaluates them in a specific order. Right? And you'll find that those orders are intuitive if you, you, know, you, you, you recognize this from that. Okay, so here is an example where we're going over exactly what Peter just mentioned, which is how parentheses get evaluated and how each step of this works. Let's see if I can make that. There we go. Okay, so if we look at this one, we have on the left-hand side, 5 minus 1. This gets evaluated, and what happens? It gets reduced to a 4 right away. Right? On the right-hand side, we have 7 plus 1 divided by 3 minus 1. How does it take this? The 7 plus 1 gets evaluated next, gets reduced to an 8. Then the 3 minus 1 gets evaluated, gets reduced to a 2. Now we have these outer parentheses here. Right? See the outer parentheses? We just did the inner ones. The outer parentheses come next, and 8 divided by 2 happens, and we get a 4. And then this all gets reduced to a 16. That's the takeaway from operators, that that's how they work. Right? And you can override them with parentheses. Override the precedence with parentheses. Uh, they're, they're talking here about, uh, this is essentially an English analogy. That's a little confusing. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to look here and we're going to see the, uh, the, the, the syntax errors. We talked about before, what is a statement, right? For your purposes, one of the big takeaways for a statement is that when it doesn't work, Python will tell you where that statement is. So when you start to write programs and those programs get big and your statement doesn't make any sense, Python's going to read it and it's going to say, hey, that statement is a problem. Let's go back and look at that. So here's an example of a statement that doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense because look at this, plus multiply, right? What, what should it do there? Does anyone have an idea? Throw an error. Throw an error. It's all it can do. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense, right? Robert? It should uh, dereference the memory location number two. And Robert is scrolling us. Thank you, Robert. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the point here is, is that it, when, you're, when you're not a computer programmer, uh, uh, when you're not something like Python, right, which is made to compile Python code, run Python code, if you're not that, you can still have something like an instruction that doesn't make any sense. Right? An instruction that doesn't make any sense is something you can't do anything with. Right? And the process of not being able to do anything with it, that's what, that's what an error is. So Python throws an error when you give it an instruction that doesn't make any sense. Because there's no way it's going to make sense out of that. Right? And then here's the, the error. And all programming languages give something similar. This is their way of telling you that you either screwed up or you're incredibly stupid. It's a syntax error. right? And a syntax error means you've essentially violated some of the core rules of the language. And that can happen all the time. You know, you could you create a, a, an English sentence that has no verbs, and you'd be like, what does that mean? You know? Banana bicycles clouds. OK. Uh, you can do the same thing in computer programming language, right? So you'll get that. Uh, now, for the next part, we, we dive right into this thing called data types. Does anyone here have an idea what a data type is? Call on someone new. Anyone in the back corner know what the data type is? No one? There we go. You Tell me, what is a string? A string is a uh, set of characters. So that's perfectly fine. That's exactly what a string is. What is an integer? So we haven't officially defined that yet. A number. A number, right? That's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. You ace it, man. A hundred. <laughs> So you have these two different things, numbers and words, or phrases, or sentences, right? right? A string is like text. You could put all of Shakespeare in a string, right? There's a certain thing you could do with that. It makes sense to think about it like text. If you have numbers, though, you can do a different set of things to it. It makes sense to say 5 plus 5. It doesn't make all that much sense to say 5 plus Shakespeare, right? So the fact that we have different types of things and we reason about that differently in English, it has to become very apparent to a computer program. You have to have, well, you should have anyway. We're not going to focus on other languages. You should have different types, and Python does. Liz. To clarify, integers are only dealing with numbers. 
but could a string be a string of numbers or is it only it's a good question right and we're going to go over that uh, but what I want to draw first is the distinction between the two right we'll, we'll get there in a minute uh, so the point here is is that when we look at sentences and we look at numbers we expect to do different things with them the computer expects to do different things with them it stores them differently and it uses them in different places right so now we're introducing this new mechanism in which we can reason about them we call that data types right so when we look at some of these data types and now we're going to hit on what Liz had to say we have for integers we have all of these great things uh, what's your name in the back Chris Chris all these great things Chris pointed out negative two negative one zero one two three four five all of those are integers right you can add five to them subtract three to them divide them whatever those are things you would do with numbers count with them right you wonder how many people are in the room well we start off with lowest being Lewis being one and we add one for each different person that's something you could do with an integer it wouldn't make too much sense to do that with the strings uh, here's examples of strings down here one character is a string a right Chris said one characters it's a series of characters that's a word we use a in this context is a character right that's what we would call a character so we have one character string we have a two character string we have a three character string right and then we have hello which is an actual word that's perfectly fine that is a string too now we have this other one 11 cats and this sits on exactly what Liz was saying can we have a string with numbers in it yes can we have a string with just numbers yes right the point is that a string with numbers is going to function differently than a number itself right think about it like this if we had 11 cats and I put 11 on one sheet of paper and I put cats on another sheet of paper and I said I want to tell you I have 11 cats what would you do take the two pieces of paper and you put them together right say okay now we have 11 cats it says 11 cats on the paper that's the thing you can do with the string called concatenation right we're gonna to get to it later but the point is you can take two different strings and add them together glue them together right it means something totally different so yes you can have strings with numbers in there right okay does anyone have any questions on any of this stuff <coughs> what about typing dynamic and static do we have to care we are definitely not going to get into that right now uh, there, there are just some questions I think that would really put us off on okay. yeah keep in mind that some of these things deal with more than one language like when you talk about different typing systems every language will have its own typing system we're only covering one language right. the last book got into a lot more about the differences so we had those conversations in this book I want to teach you how to get to browsing the web with Python pulling down pages scraping them editing spreadsheets and comparative analysis between different programming languages takes us way into left field <laughs> but it's a it's those are the conversations that we like to have occasionally at uh, flying fuck <laughs> so if you're interested in that and you really want to get into it by all means let's have those conversations okay or at the end of the class we'll have plenty of time uh, so uh, Python programs have can also have text values called strings and he tells you here you know stirs by the way I don't know if anyone in the Python community that ever calls them <laughs> that but yes I guess we always call them strings for I will always call them strings uh, you can surround them a string with a single quote character as in hello or goodbye cool world so Python knows where the string begins or ends and you can have even a string with no characters in it so we talked about having strings with numbers in it you can have strings with spaces in it here's something else to think about a space is just like any other character right you often forget about that because when we say the ABC's we don't ever say new line space any of those types of things right we don't say symbols like period or comma or ampersand or parentheses none of those are in our ABC's but for computers they are very much in a computer's ABC and the computer's ABC is called a character right so the character set includes all of those types of things uh, and it also includes digits so we have so we have another syntax error that they're showing off here we went over this let's go back here we said we we do five six plus times two we get this invalid syntax well we could also get invalid syntax if we do something like a equals 
Well, let's not do that. Let's just try this. Uh, there we go. Right, there's another error that we can get. So it's introducing you to another type of error you can get. Strings, numbers, the computer understands. It understands them because you separate numbers by something, right? If I say five plus five, we know that this thing in between the fives tells you that the one five is different from the other five, right? But strings aren't, they don't work that way. Strings, you have to give a character to separate them. So that character is a quote. We can use a single quote. We can say here, hello, class, like that, right? Or we can use a double quote. Hello, class. But if I don't add the end of the, the, the quote at the end and I just say hello, like this, it gives me an error, right? And it gives me an error because in order for that to make sense in the computer, it has to have an area to stop. It has to be able to say, this is the end of the string, now I can do something with it. So, uh, yes? Suppose you type your string and you have a single quote in the beginning and a double quote at the end. Will that also run the same error? The same error. Why do make a difference? And why I want to make a difference? Here's why I won't make a difference, Marcel. We have this, right? Let me show you this. Here's a string here. If I do this, hello. I hope I spelled your name right. Nope. Not. <laughs> How do I spell it? Two L's. You may get three next time. So here, we, got, we have this right here, right? We have the single quote, and then we have the double quotes like that, right? This would actually be a valid string. Look at that. Hello, Marcel. And I got Marcel in double quotes, right? But if I do this, hello, Marcel, it's going to be like, wait, you never ended that single quote. The double quote has nothing to do with it. It's part of that character set. The only thing that can end it is, is that same type of quote used to start it. Right? And the reason is because you can have either a quote on the inside. You want to have a string with a single quote? Use double quotes to start it. Hello, Marcel. Now I got double quotes inside of the string. You see them right here? The single quotes are inside. The double quotes are on the outside. The compiler cares about the double quotes. The single quotes are just like any other character. If I flip it, the same thing happens. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? Do we kind of get it? Okay. Yes. Yeah, let's do it. So in the second one from the last, you didn't put it before that. Right? Yeah, so you didn't put it. If you just put a double code at the end of my stuff, it would still be here, right? That's exactly right. Exactly right. To to it didn't actually matter. The point was simply that I didn't have a single quote. But that's exactly right. Your understanding of that behavior is right. So what Numine just said is if you have uh, a string, right, even if I had, let's look over here, right? Can everyone see this line that I have highlighted? If I put a double quote at the end of Marcel's name, nothing changes. I get the same error, right? And you get the same error precisely because it's not a single quote. That's what the compiler wants. You can give it anything it doesn't want, and it's going to still want the same thing. It's going to want to know where to stop. Cool? OK. Oh. All right. <coughs> so uh, we're going to come down here. OK, so we just talked about this piece of paper example. right? We talked about how we could do some things with strings. We can add them together, 5 plus 5. Well, we can do a similar thing well, no, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. We talked about how we could add integers together, like 5 plus 5, get back 10, right? But I also gave you this, this metaphor, or the, this, this example, where we have two words on two different pieces of paper, right? And if you want to get those, to bring those together, right? Python uses the same symbol for that. And you can kind of think of it in the same way. And that's an important thing to take away from this, right? When I tell you, in Python, we're going to keep rocking with this idle letter. It's working pretty well for us. But we will use PyCharm when things get more complex. When I tell Python 5 plus 5, it knows what to do. I can say add 5 to 5, and it knows what to do, right? But if I want to say add, let's say, oranges to apples, right? Apples plus oranges. If I want to say add oranges to apples, that kind of sort of makes sense too, right? I mean, you may know what that means. It means add them together like this, right? Now, there's a name for this kind of adding, 
There's a there's a very techy computer name. Concatenation. Concatenation. That's right. That's exactly right. Concatenation. You don't have to know that name, but the point is, if you squinted it the right way, it kind of makes sense to use plus for that, right? So Python, when it decides whether it's going to do math or whether it's going to do this concatenation, what it's looking at is the data type that's on both sides of that. So the data type up here is an integer, and it knows to add them, like an arithmetic. The data type here is a string, and it knows that if you give two strings to an addition operator, right, or what is really a concatenation operator, it knows to concatenate. So the point is that the, the type of this makes a huge difference when you provide it to the operator, right? Okay. So what we're going to do here is, look at this. This is the next example. This is really, this is. And I show that you can take a 5 and a 5 and add them together and do arithmetic. What happens if you try to add a 5 and an apple or a 5 and an orange? Error. Error. Python goes, what? You can add the string 5, but you can't add a 5 to an apple. Right? It doesn't, it, Python says these are two different types. I don't have an operator for two different types. This is a problem. You need to fix your code. So this is exactly the error you're going to get right here. Type error. Can't convert int object to string implicitly. Right? And we don't pronounce that str string. <laughs> when I say string, that's what I mean. That's what Python means. So, so here we have this. Alice is a string. This is an integer. And Python is telling you it wants to convert the integer to a string. So why not they why not the string to an integer? It would work. It would work. The reason for that is simple. It evaluates from left to right. Addition. Ah, okay. So addition looks at the first data type and it decides what it's going to do. So it's saying it can't make the 42 a string. There's a problem. Let's go back to our idle and take a look at it and then I'm going to show you the solution to it. Okay, so if we say here apples plus 5, we get, there's our type error. Must be string, not integer. Right? Actually, interestingly enough, we get a different type error with the same version of Python. Alice plus 42. Apples plus that is that's interesting. That shocks me. We still get an error, but the error is different, right? I don't know. I don't actually know the reason why. So here's what we should see, though. If you want to fix that, what you have to do is you have to tell Python that the five is a string, like this. Python provides a little function called string, and that says, hey, this number inside of it, this should be the string. I get yet another error over here. That's interesting too. How did that work? Uh, Maybe get the right out string. Let's see here. I'm not sure. Four five. Yeah. So the space is inside the string. Yeah. Wanted to work. yeah. I don't know why it didn't work the first time. What, what am I doing? Anyone see what I'm doing wrong here or different? Yeah. It worked the second time. It did not work the first time. So the problem is you pasted the trace back, most recent call last, at the end of that command. That wasn't actually giving me an error. I accidentally pasted it, is what you say, <laughs> which is quite possible. I do that. One of the things that I, I struggle with is copying and pasting and putting on my shirt the right way. Uh, so yes, it's one of my, my, many, my many skills here. Uh, yeah, so the point is that this worked exactly like I had said, and I was right even if I couldn't copy and paste. Uh, yes? What's the difference between putting str5 versus putting 5 in parentheses as a string? Because if you put 5 in parentheses as a string, it doesn't change the type, right? So that should not work. So if I take this and I say apples well, plus 5, like this. No, like, I mean not parentheses, quotes, quotes. She's saying if you okay. just use a five string, it will obviously uh -huh. work. Ah, okay. So that's a great point. It'll work fine. Oh. Right? Here's the thing. Sometimes functions will produce numbers. You're going to learn all about this later. They produce numbers. Right? And sometimes you're doing something with a number. Right? And when you're doing something with a number, or you have something producing a number, you've got to tell Python to change it's it's the way it's treated. 
change that. Let me give you a case in point. You could do this. You are exactly right. You could say five, this is, five, it's Jessica? Aha. You could do something like this, apples plus five. That's going to work fine. But here's what you can't do. You can't do apples plus five plus five. Right? Why? Because if I do this, what am I going to get? Give it a shot. What do you think I'm going to get? Apples for two. Apples for two. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I, I would say it'd be apples five five, but I feel like I'm wrong. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's that's what you would get. So what if you want to get apples ten? Oh. Okay. Uh -huh. We got light bulbs going. Put it, on. put it in parentheses. We got light what? Put it in parentheses. Make okay. it a higher order. So let's see here. If I put it in parentheses, right? The, the whole thing. Both of them. Both of them like that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, who here, who here thinks that this, what, who here wants to take a guess at what this is going to do? No 10. We have a lot of different people, so I'm going to call on Mumine first. <laughs> Mumine, what do you think it's going to do? Now it's my even error, but if you put marks at the outside of parentheses. When you say marks at the outside of the parentheses, what do you mean? Quotes. quotes. Yeah, quotes. So you want quotes no, square. Yeah. Here? Like this? Okay. Well, if we do that, right, let's let's take a look at this. And I know, here's the thing. They, the video guys, who I love, by the way, they have told me not to walk around. I'm going to do that anyway. <laughs> 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 I'm going to break rule. And then we're going to break the pizza. Okay. Let's look at this here, right? If we do this, we have apples and we have this, which is a string. By the way, it's green for a reason. It's green because it's telling you the way Python sees it. So it's actually giving you a hint. It's showing you here that this first parentheses is green, meaning it's a string. You're going to get apples plus an open parentheses. Then we have a five. But you're not telling it what to do with that five. right? So right there, we have a string and a number right next to each other. There's nothing in between them. That's going to be a showstopper for Python. You're blowing its mind. You can't handle that. Anyone else want to give it a shot? Let's, let's, hear, let's hear any of the ladies in the back. We're trying to have apples plus and then 10. I want it to say apple space 10. Oh, Hold on, wait, wait, one second. Say, say one more time. Uh, you can remove the quotes around the five, keep the plus, and then do string around that. You were sitting in the back and you had all this Python experience and you were going to tell me about that? <laughs> Nailed it. Boom. OK, so what do we do differently? You want to explain it? What are we doing here? We have, we have on the inside. You got this. You got it. What, what are these two things? They're integers. And what are we doing? We're doing what to the integers? Uh, just adding. Like We're just adding. Right? We, have an expert. we just want to add these integers. Now, if we didn't have string, what would happen? We'd have an error. Why would we have an error? Because you can't add a, a character. You can't add a character to an integer. So Brainiac in the back <laughs> came up with this guy here, and what does this so do? What if I transform? And how does it transform it? That's exactly right. It takes whatever's inside the parentheses, those two fives that are getting added together, they become a ten, and then it says I need to have that ten as a string. That's exactly right. So. If you want to ace this class, she already knows everything. Could we look at the SDR? Could you put the parenthetical statement in quotes? Okay. So the question is, could we do something like this? If we had this apple space plus, and then we had SDR, no, 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 just just okay. Five plus five, like this. Yes, you are with the parentheses with the parentheses inside. Yeah, inside. Okay, like this. No. Like that. Okay. That's the way you used it. Okay. No, this is this is how we figure this out. And by the way, this is what the REPL is good for because we're figuring all this stuff out. Now, in the back, what was your name? Kenya. 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 Okay, Kenya. What's going to happen if we do this? Because this whole thing on the inside is a what? That's exactly right. So when it all turns green, it's Python telling you it's just a string to me. So to you, that makes sense. But to Python, this is just like apples. Let's, let's add it, and then we're breaking for lunch. 
That's it. Apples five plus five. That's what we expected. Okay, we have we have pizzas here. Probably not enough for everyone, but enough to fight over. So on the count of three, everyone take out whatever weapons you have in your hand, and we're gonna dash to the pizza in an unruly fashion. And whoever gets the pineapple pizza, I feel bad for you because it's horrible. Okay. So we're gonna move on. We're hitting up variables, right? So here's the thing about variables. You have these different things you can work with, like a five and a five. But if you typed everything, <coughs> right, you typed everything out, you had nothing else that could change, then your program would do the same thing every time. And that would be incredibly boring, right? Oh, nope. Nope. <laughs> okay. So let's let's let me show you what I'm talking about here. We have five plus five, we have ten. Right, if I run that again, five plus five. We get back 10. If I put this in a file and I run it, we'll get back 10. And if I run that file 10 million times, we'll get back 10. That's a remarkably boring program. Now we're going to learn how to make that program slightly more interesting. We're going to introduce this concept called variables. And by the very nature of variables, as you see in science or wherever else the word appears, variables are things that can change. So here's what they do and what they offer. If we say something like a equals 5, now I can say a plus a, and I get 10. But if I say a equals 6, and then I come back and I do a plus a, now I get 12. It's changed. The a plus a is a statement, right? It's actually an expression. It's an expression. Take it back. It's an expression, right? But I can change what that variable is. And when I change what that variable is, then I get a different result. So we're introducing this as a concept. Now, when we introduce this as a concept, we'll go ahead and throw out the words that we like to use for these things. When I say 5 plus 5, I am this, this on the left and this on the right, we call these literals. That's the name, right? So you may not have to know it for this one, but that's what we would say. Literal plus literal. Now, if I say a plus 5, right now I have variable plus literal. Those are really your only two options. You either have a literal or you have a variable. Okay, so we come down here and we're looking now at the assignment statements, and this is very simple. If you have a variable, how do you change its value? What do you do? You use the equal sign, right? So what is the equal sign? The equal sign is just this, and I like this because it's very clear about it. It's an assignment operator, right? You have things like plus, minus, subtract, all of those are operators. Well, here's another one, equal, right? It's, it's, an, it's an operator. It has something on the left, something on the right, and it does something. But what it does is it changes the value of whatever's on the left. So when we come down here and we look at this, we say spam equals 40. We're setting the variable spam to 40. 40 is a literal. We're setting it spam to that literal. Now, we say what spam is, and it tells us 40. We can set eggs to 2. Now we can say spam plus eggs, and we get back 42, which, as we've already established, is the meaning of? There we go. It's another geeky reference we won't be getting into. Spam plus eggs plus spam is 82, right? So we're, we're assigning these literals to variables, and then we're evaluating them. We have people in the back squinting, so I'm going to make things big. But boom. OK, does that help? OK. Uh, so the, when you start on a computer and it sees variables, what it does is it, the, the computer says, okay, I need to have space for this variable, right? And then the second thing that it does is it says, okay, I need to set this variable to something, right? The variable gets initialized the first time you use it in Python. What does that mean? I'm going to show you here with an example. And I'm only going to show you this because the author is using these words and he's not really explaining it, right? What would it mean if a variable wasn't initialized the first time we used it? Well, we can have something like b, right? And if I said b equals 5, we could have two behaviors here that the computer could do. The first one is it could say, I haven't seen b before. I'm going to set it to 5. I'm going to create a variable called b and I'm going to set it to 5. That's one thing Python could do. The other thing Python could do is it could say, I've never seen B before. I'm going to throw an error. I don't know what to do with it. I've never seen it. Right? Some languages require you to notify Python, notify the language beforehand. 
They require you to say, hey, I want to create this variable called B or A. And then you later say, I want to set this variable to 5. The steps are broken apart. In Python, the steps are the same. You can bring any variable into existence simply by assigning to it the first time. So that's what the author is talking about there. He says right here, a variable is initialized or created the first time a value is stored in it. After that, you can use it in expressions with other variables and values. When a variable is assigned a new value, the old value is forgotten. If I assign, if I take that back and we look at that, and I have a equals 5, and I later set a equals 10, what happened to the 5? Oof. Gone. Oof. I like that. The sound effect does it all. Oof. It's out of there. You're not going to find it. So uh, it can hold something. It's like a box. But if you put something else in the box, you don't know where the other thing went. The shortcoming of the analogy. The, uh, you can call it overriding. Sure. So we have spam equals hello, spam. Spam equals hello, spam goodbye, spam goodbye, hello is gone, right? And then there you go, there's the, the analogy. Aha, uh, uh -huh. so in some languages you can't, in Python you can, and that's all we're going to focus on, just so we don't get aside. Yes, uh, let's, let's pay very close attention to that, and let's understand what the question was. Is Amy? Yeah. What Amy asked. So Amy asked this question. Amy says, we have, let's, and I, Okay, we have b equals 5, right? If I say b equals hello, is Python going to take that? What do we think? Yes. Yes. I should have asked that question before I told you the answer. That's the way things are supposed to be. <laughs> it is going to take that, right? And the reason why it's going to take that is because Python, the variable's type, right, is part of that value. You can kind of think of it like that, right? So you can assign to a variable anything you want. What was up? In some languages, it is bad. I'm not going to get, uh, come out to pho if you want to know my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> which I will readily give. Uh, yes, so Python has made a lot of, state, a lot of decisions in, in the design of the language, and there are merits to both sides of them. The advantage here is that it's very simple. Python is a language is very simple. And this class is assuming no knowledge, which is why we're still on variables. But the point here is, is that you can assign anything to a variable and it changes that variable. That's exactly right. And that's a very good question. And being that I just had a conversation with my friend that does C++ and databases, uh, this is definitely something that, you know, I know it will benefit a lot of people. Okay, so. Has examples of illegal variable names. Uh, okay, so when we have a variable, right, uh, what could be a variable? You could have anything be a name of a variable, right? No, because if you did that, Python would have a really, really, really hard time making sense of stuff. Let me give you a case in point where that doesn't make sense so you know what we're talking about. If I say five plus five equals 10, equals, let's say, three, two, there we go. Five plus five equals two, right? That doesn't make any sense at all. Right? Why does it make sense? Here's why it doesn't make sense. Because 5 plus 5 would be a horrible name for a variable. That would be a very <coughs> bad name for a variable. I can say something like this. I can say uh, uh, 2 equals 2. Right? Now I just created a variable called 2. But if I wanted to create something called 5 plus 5 equals 2, that would be stupid. It would be very complex and it would be very hard to reason about that code. Right? So what does Python say? It says you can't assign to an operator. Doesn't matter what it says, the point here is, is that you can't do it. There are specific rules for what can and can't be a variable, right? And now we're going to go over those rules. And the rule, the reason why those rules are there is so your program can make sense to you and make sense to the thing that's reading it and working with it. It can only be one word. You can't have spaces in a variable name. That would be horrible. Uh, it can only use letters, numbers, and the underscore, right? And it can't begin with a number. Those are your three rules. Do you remember those three rules? They're going to be pretty good. Uh, so you remember those three rules. You can pick any variable name you want. Right? You can have variable Mark, Zach. You can have variable Lumine. doesn't matter. Anything can be a variable name. Lumine 5, Lumine 7, uh, Zach 10. All of those are valid variable names. But if you get too crazy with it, you're going to run into these problems. And the, the end result is that I would say this. Different languages have different rules, but 
if you follow these three rules, you're generally speaking good for most languages. Right? We're not going to get into that yet. We could. <laughs> yes. Maybe we will in a second. Uh, no, but there we go. Yeah, we're, we're not going to get into that just yet. Uh, okay, so we have valid variable names, right? Here's an example balance. And we have an invalid variable name, current balance. Mm -hmm. And I would ask, why isn't this allowed? But we have the answer right here, thankfully, I guess. The reason you can't have a hyphen in a variable name. Current balance, right, is a valid <coughs> variable name, but current space balance is not. Four cannot be at the beginning. You can't just assign to a 42. You have to have a letter to start it off with, right? So 42 is not valid. Uh, you could do something like total sum, but you can't put a dollar sign in the middle of it. Because for Python, that's not a valid variable name. Uh, here we have quotation marks, right? You can't have a variable start with a quotation mark, or have a quotation mark anywhere in a variable. There we go. We're done with that. OK. There we go. OK, so now we're getting into designing programs. I have. Where are we? It's ridiculously long, sorry. Okay, no, I just wonder where it started and where it stopped before I tripped all over it. Okay, uh, so we're, we're starting now with this program. We're gonna create a program and we're gonna introduce some new things that we can do, right? So, so far we figured we have these things called operators which can provide two different arguments to them. Those arguments go on both sides of the operator. Five plus five. Five is the first argument, the other five is the second argument. Five plus six. Five is first argument, six is the second argument. Now we have these new things we're going to do. Print, right? So print is a function. So this works like you give it the function name, you start off with an open parentheses, and then you give it something. And we're going to get more into what that means later. But the point is, when you want to print something out, you can say print, and then open parentheses, whatever you want to print, close parentheses. So we're looking here at this function. This is, this is the, this program. So we have, let's start off with the first one. This thing up here at the top, this is called a comment, right? A comment tells Python, ignore it entirely. So if Python's ignoring it entirely, who are comments for? We programmers. programmers. And when they want to persist the code. Humans, I'm sorry, we had, but. Oh, for it? anybody who's seeing the code, like any human. That's right, humans, right? These are not humans. If you had no humans, you would need no comments. <laughs> we'll get there someday. <laughs> Thank you, George. Uh, but for us, right, sometimes you can reason about code just by reading it. Sometimes it's so simple that a comment doesn't add anything. It actually makes it more complex. But sometimes code is too complex to be reasoned about or more complex than would otherwise be. So you want to just give people a little description about it, right? Think of it like the cliff notes. Eh, maybe? Uh, so. You can write whatever, so he says up here, this is a program that says hello and asks for my name. You just read that, now you know what the program does. What's easier, to read that and understand what the program does, or to actually have to read all this stuff to figure it out, right? So, uh, yeah, comments can be very useful. Now, he, he starts off and he says, print hello world, that means he's telling Python, put this to the user, give them this string, hello world, right? And then print, what is, the, what is your name? So now, Python has told you, hello world, what is your name? Now he's got this thing. My name equals input. My name is a what? You have two. String. Who said variable? Oh, love it. Variable, right? It is a string. It's typed as a string. But what I'm looking for is variable, right? Uh, and what, you know, it's a string because you're, you're giving it a name, right? The, the point here is, is that input is going to go out to the user. And it's going to ask for something. Input is going to return something, likely a string, and it's going to assign it to my name, right? Now, my name, if you want to run it, you want to correct that, you want to do it again, run the same piece of code again, right? You can run this twice. Python will ask you twice, what is your name, <coughs> right? So you say, hello world, what is your name? And then you say, get input from the user and store it in my name. Then print, it is good to meet you, and then whatever the user gave you. The length of your name is, and now we have two functions, print, length, name. It's going to tell you how long your name is, right? Then you say print, what is your age? And we do the same thing, my age equals input. 
Then we're saying print, you will be, and now we're concatenating it, right? Quick question from someone who hasn't answered, hasn't called upon. What is concatenation doing and how is this working? Anyone want to give that a shot? Mashing strings together. Mashing strings together, right? So we're taking this string here. I'm going to pull this up so people in the back can see it. Uh, we have this string here, you will be, and we're saying we want to concatenate, we want to mash them together with this string here. So whatever is happening here is going to turn into a string. And then we're concatenating it again within a year. So let's go through this, right? Print, you will be, and then we have your age, right? We're saying we want that as a number, right? So if I give it 15, it's going to add 1 to 15 because we're taking that 15 as a string, and we're saying we want to make it an A. So 15 plus 1 is 16. Make it a string. You will be 16 in a year. What is your, your age? Add one to your age. Throw it out to the user and tell them how old will be next year. Right? Okay. How does it know that the, uh, my name is a string before the user anything and my age will be a teenager before the user anything? Okay, so that's a very good question. And I think that's also what Robert was talking about. Input is always going to return a string. Right? So it's something you should know, that the computer doesn't assume you're going to give it a number with input. So it's always returning a string, and you can make that string a number. Right? So when you say int my age, you're telling Python, in this case, I need to, to interpret that as an integer. Okay? So in res you know, with that in mind, Robert was totally correct to say that, that input is returning a string. But what I was looking for is that my name is a variable. Okay, so we're going to take this and we're going to run it. And this is, I'm going to show you now why I don't like idle and why it totally works, right? If I take it here, we're going to pop it over here. Okay, we printed out Hello World. We knew what that was going to do. I'm going to come over here and we're going to say, print, what is your name? Now I want you to see, see how this has a comment out here too? We saw the comment up here where we start, and the whole line is a comment, and then we saw it down here. The number sign, right, starts the comment. It can be anywhere in the line, and then everything until the end is a comment. So anytime you see a number sign and it's not in a string, it starts a comment, and that keeps going until the end of the line. So now we're going to take this, paste it there, ask them, well, there you go. It didn't take me long. That's why I don't like idle because it is a pain for this type of thing. It's a pain to run code twice in it, and it's a pain to copy and paste code in it, right? It's just not, now let me show you how you would do this if you wanted to use uh, something like PyTron, which I hope everyone has got, or something similar to it. You can take it, I can paste it all right here. Now I can fix it up, I can say, okay, I wanna make this, and I realize that this is going to be unbearably small, and I'm gonna try to fix that here in a second. By the way, we had some PyCharm users. Does anyone know how to fix that off the top, or am I going to go just yeah, it? I know. Okay, what do we do? You go to uh, File. File. Settings. Settings. Up, 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 up. Hotter, hotter folder. Hotter. Yes. Okay, got it. Editor. Editor. Well, actually, well, that would work right there. <laughs> Font. 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 But uh, the appearance might uh, will make everything bigger, not just the. So where's it under appearance? Uh, down one. Appearance, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Use custom font. Or we should make it 22. That did absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you tricked me. Let's take that down to something reasonable now. 16, okay, and then apply, okay, sanity, uh, and editor. then <laughs> editor, Where do you get to that screen? okay, uh, 18, no, let's see that. okay, but I don't need this side panel, I mean, it goes away. Okay, so in PyCharm, 
I can easily paste all the code, I can steal the code, what it looks like, I can change it, and I can run the whole thing. That's unique. That's what you can't get out of idle. So there's different ways of running code. Idle is really good if you want to run something really short. But when you start to want to edit code, idle is very bad. Because editing code means running that statement again, or resetting things up again. And that's just a pain. So when I want to change things up here, it's very simple. Now all I should have to do is I should go run, run, and I should just say scratch, and it should run it right here. What is your name? Evan. What is your age? Uh, 18. <laughs> You'll be 19 in a year, right? That's how that works, totally honest. You have a question? Uh, so the thing here is, is that this allows you to run that code uh, very easily, and we can take it and we can look at it, right? And we can say, okay, well, what happens if I remove integer, right? What happens if we, we just assume something like that? What are we going to get? Anyone want to give it a shot? What, what's going to happen? Error. Error. We're going to give it an error. What is your name? Evan. Now, notice we don't have the error right now, right? This gets to Amy's question about, you know, that's bad. Well, it's bad because Python doesn't know that you have an error just yet. What is your age? 15? No, I was going with 18, I'll stick with it. <laughs> then there's our error, right? So then that's the thing. Python at that point of the code, when it hits that point of the code, it says, hey, problem, types don't match, right? Only then can it throw that error. Okay. So we're gonna go back up here, and we kind of, we understand that code. Does anyone have any questions about this? <coughs> we we kind of get this, this is our first program. We have to understand print, we have to understand variables, we have to understand the length stuff right here. It's a function, we give it a string, it tells you in integers, as an integer, how long that string is. Okay. And now what I'm doing is I'm looking, this is their example, they're running it. We already ran the code publicly. We talked about a comment, a comment is something for humans, computers ignore it. We talked about the input function, and it should say right up here, function evaluates to a string. There you go. Printing the user's name, went over that. Length, length is very simple. You give it a string, it tells you the number. It, the length of that string. Okay, so so far we've seen string in. We've used them a lot. There's one more. Well, there's actually more than one, but again, we're not doing that. There's one more that the book is introducing right now called float. Float, you give it a number, and it makes it a special type of number. Does anyone know what the difference between a float and an integer is? It's a decimal? Yes. Characters to the right of the decimal. Characters to the right of the decimal. Decimal. It's a real number. A float is a real number, and you can take an integer and convert it into a real number or float, which is, you know, you can have 24, you can have 24.0, which would be a float. That's exactly, that, that's right, yeah. Everyone is right. No one is wrong in this. Everyone has, everyone has said, everyone is right. We're all winners. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was said was, uh, it has a decimal, that's right. Here, here's a, you can just, it has a fractional component to it, right? Uh, if I give you a number, right, to the computer, that number can store one thing. And as much space as you have for that number, you, you can only store a number in it. There's no different part of that number, right? A float has to have a different part, right? There's a part of it that's a number, and then there's a part of it that represents the fractional component, right? Computers can represent it differently. For the purposes of this class, it doesn't matter. So I like all of these answers because they all address different levels of that question, right? Without getting totally geeky. You see a decimal, it's a float. That's a perfectly valid answer. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're running through this. We have string zero. Zero is a number. String makes it a string. Now we have a, a string back. String negative three point one four. What is negative three point one four? Uh, very good, awesome. Negative three point one four is a float integer. What is this? What is the the forty two? Oh, it's a string. Bada boom. Okay, someone else. Let's go to the back row. Back row middle. Uh, six people. Which one do you want to be a uh, victim that I can call on? <laughs> oh, Price. No, not you. You're the very back row. <laughs> <laughs> Purple, beigey, uh, well dressed guy. <laughs> it's not the guy behind you. I know him really well, and you're way, way undressed. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love Marco. Uh, 
Is it, is it okay if I call on you? Yeah, I, you're very attentive. That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I just don't want to like leave anyone out. Okay, uh, so yes, we're going to go down here. Negative 99, what is this? It's an integer. It's a string. Aha, uh -huh. why is it a string? That's exactly right. It's that simple. You aced it. Don't stay quiet on me. Don't do that to me. Okay, uh, behind him, we have three ladies and a Marco. Would any of those three ladies like to give it a shot? <laughs> Please? Aha! Uh -huh. And why is it a float? Because it's a decimal. That's exactly right. It has a decimal, right? So if I didn't have the 0.25 on it, what would it be? And nailed it. That's it. You aced it too. You guys need to stop being so quiet back there. Okay, it's very simple, right? The three data types we're going over, we're going over here. We want to take this float, we give it a string, right? And we're going to get back a float. And again, this is all, you only have to do this based on the operations you want to work with it. It's already in the computer. It just the computer needs to know what it needs to be to do that operation, right? Okay. Okay. Now, we went over this earlier, and we said there were three data types. They were Marco. <laughs> Three data types you went over thus far? Uh, string, uh, integer. Integer? One more. Flow. 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 Okay, right? Now here's, here, here's, here's where the book is owning up to its own mistakes, right? Uh, now here, I'm going to ask on our genius in the back, uh, Kenya, what is this? Why would you use that? False. Is it a string, integer, or float? What? The false part? Yeah, the false. Aha! Very good. Aha, very good. See? I, I tried to I tried to trick her, but no. <laughs> it's not a string, it's not an integer, and it's not a float. False is a Boolean. It's a whole different type of data variable entirely. You can do different things with them. They're really cool. They don't introduce them yet as having a different type of data. But that we will. So stay tuned. That's a Boolean. <laughs> and I and I I'll at least know one person that will ace it. Okay. Uh, so now we hit on the summary. Now we're going to get down here to the practice questions. We're going to run through these, and then we're going to hit the next section. Uh, we're going to run through, Peter, should we run through these as a group or give time? What do you say? Should we run through these as a group publicly, or should we give time? Five minutes, ten minutes? What do you think? No, I do what you said. The questions. Yeah, what about them? Do you want to run through these publicly, or do you think we should give time for that? I don't understand what give time means. Is that some of the... Okay, we'll, the code? No. We'll, we'll do them together, right? Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these, right? And we're just going to try to go through these and say which one of these are operators and which ones are values. Right? Here's what we can do. Let's start on the left. Are you? If anyone wants to pass, what you do is just point back at me. And then I'll just skip you, right? Okay. The, the asterisk. Is it an operator or value? You're kicking it off. You got two options. Boom. An operator? Boom. 100%. <laughs> this. Operator value. Value. Got it. Operator value. Value. Got it. Operator value. Operator. Aha. Nice. Operator value. Right operator. here. There you go. Move it. Um, got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which of the following is a variable and which is a string? Before that, um, yes. No, that's no, a string. It's string. <laughs> what would you do with it? Let me ask you that. Hello in quotation marks. To me, it sounds like operator is something. Instruction is given. Is like a string. Yeah. Anyway, so maybe I'm just confused. No, you're, you're not. We, we're going to cover that, right? So if an operator is something, you're going to you're going to provide it an argument, and it's going to do something with it. That's a string. That sits in a part of memory in a computer, and it never forgets it. It's like your age or your name, right? Your name, you don't do anything with it. It just is. You can rename yourself. You can call yourself whatever you want, but you can never do anything with your name by itself. It just is, right? Same thing with your age. It just is. So you can ride a bicycle, but you can't ride your name or ride your age. There's no verb there. 
the operator is something that's going to be done, like adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Those are operations. Five, six, hello, those are values. Okay. Does that make sense? Is that there only four? No, there's, because there's, remember, you have the plus on the string, concatenation, mesh two strings together. You have the plus for numbers. You have division, subtraction, multiplication, exponentation, two raised to the fifth power. You have a lot more. The equal sign, all of those are things that the computer is going to do, right? So, uh, okay. Which of the following is a variable and which is a string? So, you may just answer. Uh, the top one is variable. Huh. Great. Okay. Well, Lewis, she just, she just, you're acing it now. No, I'm kidding. Uh, okay. Uh, name three data types, Lewis. You want to give me one of them? Give me one. Uh, okay. Do you remember what this is here? The thing in the quotes. It's a value, but what type of value is it? Okay, no problem. Hey, we're all new here. What is it? A Jessica. string. It's a string. There we go. So we have two more. Jared, what's the other one? I'm sorry. Another type of data type. You following? Uh, like float. There we go. Float. Zach? Integer. Integer. Got it. Okay, done. Uh, what is an expression made up of? What do all expressions do? That is a crazily uh, vague question. <laughs> <laughs> of these questions would rather be a tree or uh, grass, you know, and why? Uh, the chapter introduced the assignment statements, like span equals 10. What is the difference between an expression and a statement? Uh, yes, I, we're going to skip that one, too, because that's a very complex question that can be answered at different levels. You like that question? Yeah, I would like to know. So, precisely so I can answer that about. one in a way that's a little bit better than my analogy before. <laughs> <laughs> Expressions always can be simplified to a value. Whereas statements, sometimes it's just a command to tell it to do something and it doesn't actually happen. So 3 plus 2 can be simplified to 5. But if this is true, then do something else. That really, there's no simplification. Okay. You can do um, cool. expressions, evaluate, if you will, statements, execute. Yeah, but you just put it off then. So what's the difference between <laughs> evaluation? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's what they did. That's, that's going to get fun really, really fast. How about the execution? exercises some action, creates an action, whereas uh, an expression can reduce to a value. I, I think that, you know, the thing is, like, I, I would love to have that conversation. If I give a counterexample where that gets muddy, I, it's just going to blow everyone's mind. <laughs> that's the, the position that I'm put into. So, uh, yes, if these work for you, that's fine. Uh, the reality is that I think that you're just as well off with Ed's first statement and rocking with that, because we're on the first chapter. Ed's first statement was, you can think of an expression like a phrase, and you can think of a statement like a sentence. And to be honest, that's where I will leave that off. Because the rest is very technical and partly historical. And uh, I, I just don't want to go there right now. Uh, so why does the variable bacon contain after the following code runs? Bacon equals 20, bacon plus 1. What is bacon equal to? Wait, wait. Uh, okay, where did we leave off? Uh-huh. Uh, My friend. 21. It, it equals what? 21. Okay. Uh, let's go one over. Do you think it equals 21? No, there's not an assignment. It just is bacon plus one. And uh, print 21. 2N no, Susan no. has got it. <laughs> okay. So what 2N what Susan just said was that bacon equals, by the way, 2N Susan is on Discord. If you're not in the Discord, join it because 2N Susan is, and it's awesome. <laughs> Bacon equals 20. Oh. Bacon plus 1. Did I get that right? Yeah, but 1 and Susan is way more active than I am. She's got a lot of information. Well, you're going to become more active because you're going to have 30 <laughs> Bacon equals 20. Like bacon. bacon plus 1 doesn't change the value of bacon, right? And 2 and Susan nailed it. She said there's no assignment, you know? You can do something, but the only way you can change a value is with an equal sign, and there simply isn't an equal sign there. So if you wanted to say 
bacon equals 20, bacon plus one, here's what you would do, right? We're gonna come down here, let's use something that's more uh, culturally sensitive. We'll use Coke equals one, right? Coke equals Coke plus one, right? There we go. Now we have Coke and it equals two. If I say Coke plus one, now we get three, but did we change the value of Coke? No. no. We didn't. Coke stayed the same, right? So there's the reality. The reality is that you, you only change a value with an equal sign. Very simple. Okay. Do we have a question? I didn't get the same thing. I put Coke plus one. Oh, we just took Okay. Okay. Very cool. Don't confuse what you get back as an expression, right? What you get back when you evaluate something as being the, what the variable is set to. They're two totally different things. It, it, is what you're saying the third line of code that you wrote basically is nonsensical? It, it won't take that as anything new because there's no equal sign? It won't store. There's no storage there. You're yeah. doing the easy way is you can stop thinking of this as an equal sign. This is an assignment operator. I know it's typed as an equal sign. I know we've called it an equal sign forever, but there's no equality. This is store it, store the right hand side into the left hand side. Okay. And so this is not Coke equals Coke plus one. This is Coke is assigned to the value of Coke plus one. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, okay, very cool. Let's go down here. Why is X a valid variable name while what 100 is invalid? Who wants to hit on that? Why is 100 an invalid weight? Susan's done. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do it. Why is 100 an invalid variable name? Because you can't start with a number. That's okay. it. Bada boom. Marcel, my friend. Mm -hmm. Question number nine. Mm -hmm. What three functions can be used to get the integer floating point number or string version of that value? What are the three functions we got? The three, the three functions for get the integer floating point number string version. ST. STR. Bada boom. One of them's down. You got two more to go. Read what we're trying to go to, and then think of a mnemonic, right? Floating point. Floating. Not bottom, boom, you got it. Okay, so now it floats down in. There you go. That's simple. Okay, Dan, what, what, why does this expression cause an error? How do you fix it? I have eaten uh, 99 burritos. What's wrong with that? Uh, 99 is an integer, and the other two are uh, strings. That's exactly right. How do we fix it? Make, uh, Change 99 to a string. That's exactly right. How do you do it? You do str close friend open friend 99 in the middle, or you put quote marks around it. That's exactly right. Very cool. Okay. Uh, okay. Look, here's the extra credit assignment. Uh, search the uh, Python documentation for the length function. It will be found on a, on a web page titled Built-in Functions. I'm not going to do that because that's stupid. Teaching people how to use Google is not fun. So uh, <laughs> Google on your own. what I am going to show you though is that we have we have this this thing. We go back to this REPL, where right? we go back to our idle, we go back to our Python. Python has all of the abilities to look up this stuff up, right? Right from Python. You don't have to go out to Google. And it's actually more useful to me. Experienced programmers use the documentation language comes with. Because it's always more efficient, unless you're reading the official documentation on the web. So we want to find out here what is the documentation on the len function, right? That's what it said. It said it right here. Documentation for len. How do we do that? Open up Python, right? Help len. Just like that. Enter. Up. Length takes an object and it returns the number of items in a container. There's your documentation on it. It's that simple, right? So from within Python, you can type in help and you can give it any function name and get an answer back. Now I'm going to blow your mind with two more things. If you type nothing and you just give it help and you give it open and open close parentheses, you can enter it. It even comes up and it tells you, hello, let yes. me help you out. Yeah. Right? It's very simple. Here's something really cool that it tells you here too. Uh, it tells you the address of the tutorial. It's another resource you can use when learning Python. There is an official tutorial for Python. It helps you get into it. It has nothing to do with automate the boring stuff. If you want additional help, thorough help, that's a, another great method of learning Python. Uh, okay, and it tells you right here, there are different things you can get help with right away. Modules, keywords, symbols, or topics. We're not going over any of them right now, but all you'd have to do is type in keywords, and you can see what those keywords are. 
I lied. We're going to go over keywords right now. <laughs> and then we're not going to go over any of them right now. Because Peter asked a question about keywords, and I wanted to hit on that. So we talked about a variable name. And I said, what is about a variable name and what is not? Uh, do we want to do names? Is everyone here cool? Probably. Are you cool with giving me your name? Anyone in the best not cool with giving names? Because we're going right to the next target. OK. Oh, me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't care. Well, what is your name? Christina. Christina, awesome. Christina, we were just talking about variable names, and we said variables can't start with a, a number, right? Well, here, something else they can't start with. If you look right here, you're going to see special words. None of these have a number, and none of them can be variable names. Why? Because these are words that mean something special to Python. And we're going to go over a lot of them different, uh, a lot of them later. You can't call a variable false, none, true, and as. Why? Because all of that means something somewhere else. And it would blow Python's little brain if you did that. So those words are reserved. And we call reserved words keywords. That was asked in a question. I just wanted to show it off. On top of those three rules we have, here are the exceptions, the irregular names. OK. Uh, next to Christina, we have? Andres. One more time? Andres. Andres? Andres. Uh, yeah. A and D R E S. Andres. Andres. Okay, very cool. I am actually stupid. Your name is awesome. Uh, so we're out of questions. I don't have anything for you. So you want to get lucky. Uh, no, I'll call on you later. You don't get lucky. Cool names don't get you that. Okay, so uh, flow control. Moving on to the next chapter. Okay. So the book shows these little diagrams. What we're talking about here is we have one quick question. Yes. If, they're like this, you can if you go into keywords and you start typing in keywords like Techman Hill and go into keywords and everything, how do you get out? Uh -huh. Control. Okay. So, so we're going to go over that, right? That's a good question. We typed in keywords. Now, how do we get out of the screen now that we're in it, right? Okay. Does anyone know the answer? Q. Well, it says right there in the second paragraph. It says right where in the same paragraph. Just type quit. Just type, just type quit. In the second paragraph. Aha, uh -huh. just type quit. There you go. So it actually tells you right there. Yes, okay, so there's three answers to this. One of them is Q or quit. And then the other one is control V or control C. Those are the jobs. So control V and you're out. Okay. So, uh, but Q is, is easy, so just use Q. Okay. Yes, Amy? Say it one more time. Is Python case sensitive? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so we have now we have programs. We've learned about variables. We've learned about some of the things we can do with them with these operators and these assignment things. Now we're going to talk about how we use them. And one of the things that always comes out, and by the way, when you're a programmer, you will hear this all the time, is pseudocode and flowcharts. That's how the whole rest of the world that doesn't understand us communicates with us. <laughs> what does it sound like? It sounds like, well, uh, if I want this to happen, then do that. That's where business starts at their communication levels. If I want this to happen, then do that, right? And then it just gets closer to where we're at. <laughs> so here's an example of a flow chart. What we're doing here, we start off with start, is it raining? If it is raining, we go over here to yes. If it's not, we go to no. If we have an umbrella, we go to yes. And it tells us to go outside. So if it's raining and we have an umbrella, we can go outside. If it's raining and it's not, we can just go outside. Let's go down here. Is it raining? Yes. Do we have an umbrella? No. Right? Wait a while. Because we don't want to go outside without an umbrella. Or what happens is we can say, do we have an umbrella? No. We can wait a while. Is it raining? Okay, that's the next question we get asked. If it's still raining, wait more. That's what they're doing. They're looping back. If it's not raining, then go outside. Right? So is it raining? Yes. I have an umbrella? No, I don't have an umbrella. So wait. Okay. Is it still raining? No, go outside. And so that's how we go outside. We're factoring in rain and umbrella and how much time we wait and all that other kind of stuff. It's not that complex there. Okay, it's telling me that my ad block is being overly aggressive. Let me turn it off on this side. You have to refresh. Yeah, I thought Control R would do it, but not apparently. Okay. So this thing in the middle of this author's site, for those that don't know, this is actually a place where you can type in code. Should be able to type in code. 
Okay, this one you can't type in code. That's confusing. Okay, let's ignore that then for now. Oh, no, you can't type in code. It's just really, really slow. There you go. Okay. So yes, you can type in code there and show him that to you. So here's where he's introducing Boolean values. So he says, while the integer floating point and string data types have an unlimited number of possible uses, the Boolean data type only has two values, true and false. Right, so all Boolean things have to be reduced to true or false. Now you actually see Boolean data type. So the author told you three types in chapter one, now we got our fourth, Booleans. Right, so he's showing you right up here, and ignore the, the stuff that I typed in that broke things. He's saying spam equals true, spam and it's returning true. True, capital T, Python is case sensitive, as Amy pointed out. Capital T, R U E, is how you type in true in Python. Capital F, A L S E, is how you type in false. So those are two special values, and you can do cool things with that. So, uh, and we're going to go over some of those later. So we have now. Ed pointed out earlier, right, he said equals is not really equality. It's not testing for equality. It's assigning, right? Python made the decision now, uh, not always that way, but now it is. A equals 5, right, sets A equals to 5, right? There's another operator now that tests for equality. So you can say A equals equals 5, right? Now this doesn't assign to A. This says is A equal to 5? and it's going to return true. It can only ever return true or false. Is A not equal to 5 is false? Is A equal to 5 true? So we come down here and we look at these. We have equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. And these are all part of this comparison operator. So we've seen assignment operators, we've seen math operators, and now we've seen comparison operators. And here's some examples. 42 equals 42, that's true. 42 equals 99, that's false. 2 not equal to 3, true. 2 not equal to 2, false. It's very simple. We go down here, we're looking at these. These are string equality. Dog is not equal to cat, true. True equals true, that's true too. Why is it true? Here's a question for you. Let's go back. Uh, and Andres. Andres, did I get it right? Yes. Oh man, I have myself. Okay, uh, I thought I, I, I missed that one. Okay, true is a Boolean what? Uh, operator? Expression. Data type, right? It's a data type. If it was an operator, it would be doing something, but true by itself doesn't do anything. It just is, like your name, like my name. It, so if it just is, it's a data type. So we say here that true equals, equals true. We're comparing true to true, right? Robert. True is a value. Yes. Yes, true is a value. Uh, that's exactly right. That's my oversight. Very good. True is a value, right? Boolean is the data type. But my point here is, and that's that's absolutely correct, that's my own fumble, that when we say true equals equals true, we're testing whether or not true is equal to true. That that equality test is there. We can do that equality test because true, just like five, is a value. It's of a different type. Five is a value of the integer type. True is a value of the Boolean type. Just like we can test to see whether or not five is equal to five, we can test whether or not true is equal to true. These two things can be compared, not to themselves, but they can be compared to other data types, right? But five could be true, that's... Five in Python is not true, right? Python only true is true. Five. Okay. All right. So we have here five, right? And we can say five equals true. We cannot because these are two different types. Actually, you can. Okay. I thought that was going to actually error. <laughs> so you Python will return false if they're not of the same type. That's what's actually happening. The thing here is is that like any value. You can compare them to themselves. Ed? What you're actually receiving back is not the value of 5 or the value of true. But when you do a comparison, comparison resolves to a third value, the Boolean value of whether that statement, that little snippet of text, 
is factual or you know non-factual. And so five will never equal true. So that statement will always be false. Yep. Yep. You can compare any values together, right? Even if they're of different data types. So here we're comparing an integer and a boolean. It's always going to be false. Python just tells you false. But you okay. can't compare um, true to true in lowercase No, we'll give you an error. We'll just say false. We'll just say. Well, that's because lowercase true is actually not special. That's that's a, that's a syntax error. So if I say true equals true like that, then what you actually get is true is not defined. And that's because only the uppercase true is a Boolean value. The lowercase true, it's not it's nothing special. Right? Uppercase true is special. It means that this is a Boolean value. So lowercase true is no different than something like this, ASDF. ASDF equals true. Right? This is the same thing. <coughs> Both of these are syntax errors. They're both the same types of syntax errors. Is that, does that, no. am I throwing you off? Are you no, no, it, it, it can be, because mm. it's not a special word, the lower case true, somebody would probably use it for a variable assignment name. Okay, <laughs> that's another really, terrible. okay, so let's talk about that, right, because that's fun too. Malicious trolling. If it's not <laughs> special, what does that mean? What does it mean if it's not special? It means that you can actually say true equals six, right? <laughs> And now I can say true plus one. Don't ever do this. But what I'm trying to show you is that uppercase true and lowercase true are totally different. One of them is special, and one of them is just like anything else. And just like anything else, you can assign to it, make it a variable, do all those horrible things. And yes, you very bad. And the reason it's truly horrible is because, Evan, now you can do that same comparison with lowercase true. He, you know, is compared to six. Yeah, yeah, we can keep going out of it. <laughs> 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 horrible things are, are one of our favorite conversations. Yeah, it's it's fun. Fun. <laughs> if you're working with one of these condition things, if this is what this is all about, right? And you want to say that something is equal to five, and then you want to say if that something is true, then isn't the thing its existence means that it's true? In Python, okay, this gets down to like, what do you know, what do you do, right? You obviously can do this in Python. You can say something like, if five equals true, right? You can do, well, no, you can. Uh, you can do five equals true. It would look slightly different for a conditional. Well, no, no, set, set, set a, uh, uh, take, take a, a variable, right. assign a value to it, and if it's got a value, then it's, true in a new statement or yes. yes but you can also do something like i don't really the thing about these questions is they're going to require me to go a lot more in depth well, that's, what he's, that's what he's going to do for the next 10 pages you can <coughs> right but that's the next 10 pages you could do you know like this you could do uh not equals to uh no right or none rather not equals to none is the python way right. and then that will tell you whether or not that variable is set and has a value that to me looks better than the opposite but I don't want to go into that now, so let's leave that alone. And we'll get there, I promise. So any number except for one is just false. Would evaluate if you're doing any comparison. Um, Python is actually going to check the types. So one itself is not a Boolean. And trying to do something like the old C trick of if one, that is not going to do what you think it is. Right. That's right, because now you're doing a comparison operator, and so you'll see whether or not one is equal to one, and the evaluation of that comparison will return back. Let's, we're going to, yeah, start, oh, I, I never stopped it, so oops, I did stop it just now, because it's actually really good. Okay, let's give that a shot. Uh, yeah, so we're going to get back oh, now. Content is provided under a creative content. <laughs> that was the author. Okay, uh, let's get back to the the thing. I'll make the wrong stuff. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna skip over this because I don't want to get too far off off this. We have uh, Boolean operators. So we talked about arith arithmetic operators, right? We can say five plus five. We can do some really cool things with Booleans too. We're gonna take a look at some of them now, and this helps us reason about programs and create that flowchart, right? So when we have something <coughs> like true. Right, what can we do with it that makes sense? In my opinion, true equals five doesn't make sense, even if Python accepts it. 
That's why I don't have that in my code. But you can do things that make sense with, with true. Like true and true. That makes sense to me. Rather, true and true. So you can say true and true, and Python returns true. This is part of the Boolean logic rules, right? right? So Python gives you some operators that make sense. You can say true or true, and you're going to get back true. Mm -hmm. You can say false or false or true. False. True. False or, or true, true. Or true. true. Right? You could say false or false and get back false. Now, why is this useful? It's useful for things like this. I can say, uh, I can say my age equals, let's say, 18, right? And I can say uh, Ed's age, right, who is teaching the next class, and we can say uh, 127. <laughs> <laughs> Two to the eight minus one. And there we go, yeah. <laughs> two to the eight minus one. So now what we can do, right, is we can look at these two things and we can start to do work with them, right? So I can say here, my age is greater than Ed's age, right? That's going to return true, which is really cool. My age is true. No, I was thinking in my head the opposite. Ed's age is greater than my age is going to return true, right? It's telling you Ed is older. That's what that would be. Is Ed older? Yes, he's older. Now, you can say or, right, or we can do, uh, well, Ed is already older. And, right, uh, Ed's age, is Ed older, and is he less than 200? <laughs> right? If I hit enter now, you're going to see it say true, because Ed's less than 200. We've defined Ed as being 127. But if I want to do is Ed older and less than 100, it's false. So these types of things allow you to chain together different statements, right, and simplify them. Like we said earlier, take expressions, reduce them to a value, take expressions, reduce them to a value, so on and so forth. That's how you're going to start creating programs that are more complex, right? So now we're testing for two things. We reduce both of them to Booleans, and then we say, is this, which is true, and this, which is false, is it true or false? And that ends up becoming something like this, true and false. True and false is false, right? So if you don't, does anyone know the Boolean truth table? Does that make sense? Have people heard of it or seen it? Yes. If you haven't, true and true is always true. True and false is always false. You have to have true on both sides of and for it to be true. And on or, you have to have true on either side. Right? So if I say true or false, it's true. If I say false and false, false. Right? If you have two truths, it's still true. So this is how we speak English. This is just how a computer reduces it. Right? If I tell you right now, uh, go to the store and pick up a uh, carton of milk or a carton of apple juice. Right? You have to get one or the other. Right? If I tell you to go to the store and pick me up a carton of milk and a carton of apple juice, you have to get both. What we're doing is these English terms for this just get put right into the computer program. And they help you write those programs where you're modeling that stuff. Okay. So not is, is uh, an operator and essentially just inverses it. If I say not true, it's false. If I say not false, it's true. That's all there is to that one. Very simple. Okay, mixing Boolean and comparison operators. Four is less than five, that's true. And five is less than six, that's also true. So the result here is true. Four is less than five and nine is less than six, that's true and false, which makes it false. By the way, in case you don't get this notation here, this is probably also worth pointing out. The author is typing in both of these, right, at the same time. And Python is giving him back two answers in the same order. Okay. That's just the way this web interface works. It's not the best, but that's how, the, that's how this web interface thing is, is doing it. So here's something more complex. Now we're seeing how we can build it up. Two plus two, we reduce that. What do we get? Two plus two? Four. Easy. Is four equal to four? Yes. True. Right? So we have true on one side and not. Right? Is two, what's two plus two? Four. Is four equal to five? No. So that's what? Not no is true. False. 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 So we know that this is false, right? We've said that. So we know we have here true and not 
False and what is over here? Two and two equals two plus two. Is that false? Yeah. Is two plus two equal to two times two? Usually. Yes, yes true. Okay, <laughs> true, right? The only one where you get that. Usually, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so we have this right here, true and not, true and false, right? And we hit enter on that, and we get true, which is exactly what the top says, because it gets reduced to that. So we look at it, and we go, okay, so what's happening here? Well, what happens is, you go up, the author says, he doesn't actually talk about the person. Yeah, here. What's, what's happening here is that these off, this is getting reduced further, right? So true and not false and true. Yep. What is not false equal to? True. 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 So we're going to take it and we're just going to replace this. True and true and true. true. So if we say true and true, what does that get reduced to? True. True. And my thing just restarted. That's really annoying. So we had true. What is going on here? There we go. Okay. I think that's going to solve the problem. Let's get one more second here. Okay. So we had we had true and true and true, right? And I was saying, what does it reduce to? It reduces the true and true, which is just simply true. And that's how that looks. Those are the last steps. So you can take any Boolean operator and balloons on both sides and immediately reduce them. And that's all he's doing there. Okay, uh, we have another one. Is this the same one? No, this is the one that we did, okay. And he's actually showing you how he's doing it. So left and right, it both gets reduced. First one, left, then the second one, right, and then true and true is true. So now we're gonna get into flow control. And what we have here is, uh, different things we can do. So we talked about it earlier, and I said that when you talk to business people, they're going to say, if what I want, uh, then do what I want it to do. Something like that. Like That's how people think computer programmers talk. Uh, well, that's because if is something everyone knows. And if is very simple. If works like this. You take right down here the variable and the literal you're comparing it against. And if it equals, if the name equals Mary, then this code block underneath is going to happen. Right? So the next question is, what is a code block to Python? Now, if you come from a different language, you may see it with braces. Or if you see code online, like with JavaScript, you may see actual braces. But with Python, what happens is determined by indentation level. And this is the first time you're seeing it. So on the left-hand side of the print, we have two indents. See that? See how I'm doing that too? So that's telling you that if this is true at the top, all of this stuff underneath it runs. So is the name equal to Mary? Mary's up here. We're testing to see whether or not Mary's the same. It is. So this becomes true, right? And then all of this code underneath it works. Hello, Mary. If password equals swordfish, and it does, we already know that's true, then we're just going to print it out, if true, and you get access granted. Right? And that's exactly what happened when they ran this code. Hello, Mary, access granted. Because both of these evaluate to true. So now we're getting into how we design an if statement, right? We already talked about indentation as prime. The other thing that you need to know when you're doing an if statement is the colon. And that's really all there is to it in Python. So you have colon and you have tabs. Now this gets back to one of the other things we talked about, idle. I said why I don't like idle, because it's a pain to edit things. With Python, it's tab sensitive. If you write this line in idle, and then you write this line in idle and you forget the tab, you have to go rewrite the whole thing. That becomes really, really tiring. So if you take this over here, and we copy the same code, right? We can say if true, this runs. And then I run it, and it prints out right down here, this runs. Now if I screw this up, like I frequently do, and you forget the tab, and you run it, what are you going to get? Expected an indented code block. But because I'm using an IDE, the advantage, I can just go right here, tab, and then do it again. 
and that's it. You don't have to rewrite all that code like you do in something like Idle. Okay. Yes. How how really characters does it have to be? Because I, sometimes I set my task space in like four characters. Does that have to be five spaces or four, or does it just have to show sense that there's a tab there? I don't. Okay. Here's the deal. I use tab. So to be honest with you, I don't actually know the answer for spaces. I want to say it doesn't matter. No, 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 I'm not saying spaces. You know, in some IDs, you can set tab equal to four spaces or however many spaces you want. But is it, is it putting in spaces when you hit tab, or is it just changing the display? Uh, so what you're saying, as long as it recognizes the tab inside the, inside the character, it doesn't matter what it displays because... That's right. Tab is a tab is a tab, and you can change how it displays in your ID. Okay. Right? Some people use spaces, and I don't think it matters either. I think that Python will just look at the, the level. Right? So if we come down here and we say spaces instead, like I'm using a tab, but let's just do spaces. Here's two spaces. Does it work? I assume it's going to work. It works. If I use one space, is it going to work? It has to be at least one space, and it has to be the same throughout. That's right. That's your rule. Ed? So this, when you say that some IDEs use four spaces for tabs, there are also IDEs that when you type tab, it actually inserts four spaces. And this makes it even more confusing. As long as whatever is indented in the line above, it is indented in the line below, Python sees those as the same level of indention. But if it's different in any way, all bets are off. <coughs> Except I don't think you can make space to the tab. No, it doesn't. It generally doesn't like that. Guys, let's, let's have that conversation the weeds a little up. bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Please, a fun, worthy conversation. How Python handles but mixed spaces and tabs is a fun conversation, I'm sure, but not here. Uh, but yes, it's all valid. You know, it's going to work. Okay, so uh, we have here name equals Bob, and then we say if name equals Alice, print hi Alice, is Bob equal to Alice? Okay, now we left, we did Andres work, Robert. Is Bob equal to Alice? No. So what gets replaced here where name <coughs> equals equals Alice? But I think you meant to ask is name equal to Alice? Bobby. Yes, there you go. is name equal to Alice. So then it will say hello stranger. It will be, but what gets what what does this effectively reduce it? False. That's exactly right. Name isn't equal to Alice, so it gets replaced with false. And because it's not equal to Alice, this block of code does not run. And this block of code underneath it, else, does run. So here's the takeaway. The takeaway is this. When you run an if statement, you can always create a statement that runs as an alternative. And that alternative is just else, right? So this is the first block in the if statement. That happens if this is true, the top. Name is equal to Alice. This is going to run. If it's not true, else, this runs. It's that simple. It's just like English. And then we have a lot of flowcharts here. If you like flowcharts, by all means, do it. Uh, Okay, we have, we have another thing here. Sometimes you want to check if you have one, two, three, four things, you know. You have different conditions you want to test for, right? I'll give you a case in point. If I say uh, you go to HEB and you get a free bag of potato chips if you get a rotisserie chicken or a turkey breast, right? Then when you check out at the end of that line, it's going to say, do you have a rotisserie chicken in your cart? Do you have the turkey breast in your cart, right? So if you have the first one, you can give one discount. Or if you have the second one, you can give another discount. You can, you can structure things like this. Let me clean that up a little bit because that didn't make all that much sense, right? If I say this, right, let's clean that up. If I say this, if you have, uh, here, uh, it's really hard to think of these examples off the top. So if you say something like, if you have, if you buy, a, eh, what do you say? If you're over 65, or you bought a chicken. Yeah, but we're trying to explain ELSIF. Oh, ELSIF? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's just any kind of policy where it's a lot easier to express it. Here's um, one. Here. Mm -hmm. let, me give, let me give you another one. OK, here. If your age is over 65, and uh, you purchased a chicken, right? Right, then we can do one thing. We can say here. Uh, you could say something like sales total, and then you could say equals sales total minus five, 
right? You're saving $5 because you're over 65 and you bought a chicken. But if you purchase the chicken and you're not over 65, right? Then what's going to happen is your sales total is going to equal sales total minus $2, right? And here's the deal. The deal is, yes, in, in e Python it's ELIF, E-L-I-F, ELTSIF, right? Now what you're doing is you're saying if you're over 65 and you purchase a chicken, a chicken you're going to save $5. But if you're not over 65 and you purchase a chicken, you're going to save $2. Chickens are discounted $2. If you're over 65, they're discounted $3 more. So there you go. But what you don't want is everyone that comes in that purchases a chicken to get the $5 rebate and the $2 rebate. Right. You see it? <laughs> You don't want that because now all of your chickens are going to be seven dollars off, right? If you're over 65. So this is what you do: use ELIF, and that tells you only one of those blocks can run. So here we have the first block. It only runs if the top is true, right? If this, if you're over 65 and purchase a chicken, you run this code. Else, if you purchase a chicken, you run this code. You don't run both of them. Now, if I removed it and I got rid of this ELIF and I just said if. Let's take a look at that. Now I have two blocks of code. What happens? Mm -hmm. both what happens if you're over 65? You get the minus five. You get the minus five, and then what? And then you get the minus two. So this is the difference. The difference here is that if you have the elif, right, the else if in Python, you can get one or the other. If you remove the L and you just have the if, you can get both. Because now you're testing both things for true. If they're true, you can execute both code blocks. Does that make sense to everyone? Because I turned that really horrible example that I muddied up the first time, my bad, into this one. I think this one's actually pretty good. Not bad. Not bad? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's your takeaway. L if, you're only executing at most one code block, right? Two if statements, you can execute both code blocks. And if you have an else anywhere, like even if you had this, else if, else, and then you could say something like here, uh, else, sales total equals sales total. Sales total equals here. Okay, so someone tell me what that code does. Because this doesn't make any sense. I just want someone to read it so it makes, so they can kind of reason about it. Zach, you're already laughing. We have, uh, what, what's the name of the back? It's absolutely. One more time. I know your name online. Danny girl? Uh, Danielle. 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 Danielle, could you tell me what this does? <laughs> Did you want to give it a crack? All right. So what, the whole if? Yeah. Okay. What, what does that last piece do, the else? The else, if neither prior condition are met, it adds five to the sales total. Right. So the first condition is met if you're what? If you're both over 65 and you purchase chicken. Right, and the second condition is met if when? If you are not over 65 and you purchase chicken. That's beautiful, you said that exactly right. Props. And the third condition is met when? If you are not over 65 and you did not, pur you did not purchase chicken. Or, that's not right, I'm sorry, that's, just look at it one more time. The, Excuse me, you're correct. Uh -huh. If you did not purchase chicken only, yes. That's right. So. The third clause gets hit if you did not purchase chicken, right? If you didn't purchase chicken, your sales total goes up by $5. If you did, it goes down by $2. And if you're over 65 and you did, it goes down by $5. Does that make, I mean, none of that makes sense in the real world. It's comical, and it illustrates what's happening here with the it's an if and else if. So you, oh, uh, people have a this, this is, if I make this reasonable, everything else gets crazy. What kind of grocery store are you running over there? <laughs> yeah, the, it's the Dr. Seuss grocery store. <laughs> you don't buy a chicken, your, your bill's $5 high. <laughs> <laughs> Come into my store and don't problem. buy a chicken, you're walking out with a $5 bill. It makes sense if everything else was beef. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could, I'm going to, you could just walk out with a $5 bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not just did I not make it bigger, but I totally lost where I was in it. So, 
what we're going to do is we're going to go through it and we're done with the if statements, right? So we're moving on. Uh, and I'm going wildly. I have a question. Yes. Is that uh, else applying for uh, Enrich or both yes. of them? Yes. Okay, so Only that, the one of all, of all. No, it applies for both of them. Right? So let me let me let me explain that here. If we do this, if I say here, if false, no, if uh, if four is less than two, right? And then I say else if, right? And by the way, this is the way this is pronounced. You don't really pronounce this elif, right? That would be really obnoxious. It's actually pronounced else. Elif? Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So Wait, we have it's a Turkish name. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so we have if four is less than two, right? And then I'm going to give it another one. If let's say uh, 100 is less than why not two? That's also false, right? Then what I could do is say. Uh, Weird. That's a good thing to print out if that happens. Well, that never happens <laughs> because it's always false. Right? Okay. And then I could say here else, and I could say print. <laughs> there we go. It's always else. <laughs> right? It's always else. So the else applies to both the top and the bottom. Now here's the thing. If I say 100 is less than 200, now the else never runs. Never. Because you've satisfied the condition above it. If I remove that and I say is 4 less than 200, the else never runs because you've satisfied the first condition. The else in a combined if else if statement only runs if none of the conditions are satisfied. Right? If the first, then if the second, then if neither of them, else. You can think of it like that. Okay. Uh, flow charts, skipping. Okay, so we have this thing here. We're, we're introducing a new thing now called while. Right, which is a looping construct, and we're going to probably just fairly nick this before we get to the, 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 the problems. So we're probably not going to fix the problems in this class, for this one either. But we say here, name equals an empty string. While name is not equal to your name, right? please print your name. Name equals input, print thank you. Someone help me reason out what this does. Where do we leave off? Robert, Liz. Liz, help me reason out what this does. Explain this. Oh, I can't. Yeah. Okay, you want to skip it? Uh, next to Danielle. Oh, Pearl. Pearl? Yeah. You want to help me reason out what this does? Give oh. me a run through. Oh, I wasn't really paying attention, but I can try and. <laughs> you want to give a shot? Or? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what was your question? Explain to me what this code is doing. Uh, I can make it. Oh. Oops. There we go. I'm making bigger. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Okay, you have a variable that's named. Right. And then while name so is not your name, right. then you should, well, if it print, please type your name. I need to type in your own name. Somebody has to do it. Right. So and when they do it, print thank you. Okay, that's pretty close. Let's, let's clean it up a little bit. I'm going to help out. So while tells you, as long as this condition evaluates the false, right? I mean, let me let me change that. As long as that condition evaluates the true, you're going to keep running that, right? So while evaluates and continues to evaluate, so long as that condition is true, right? So what's going to happen here is name is equal to an empty string, and then we say while name is not equal to your name, it says please type your name, and then it says name equals input, and then it says thank you. This is a jerk jerk, a jerk program. <laughs> it asks you what your name is, and if you say it's Pearl. You say Pearl when it asks you, it's going to assign your name to Pearl. So name is going to be Pearl. Then it's going to say, okay, it's going to come up here and it's going to say, while name is not equal to your name. Is Pearl not equal to your name? Yeah. It's not, right? So because your Pearl and your name are different. This is yeah. the string, your name. They're different. So because they're different, right, they're not equal, this statement is going to evaluate to true. And because it's evaluating to true, it's going to come down here. It's going to say, please type your name. And it's going to wait for input. And you're going to say, Pearl, you idiot. I just typed you my name. It's going to come here and say, your name is not equal to your name. And then it's going to do it again. So what, what does it want? Your name. It wants the literal your name. Right? That's what this thing wants. And then it'll print out thank you. And then it'll print out thank you and you're done. That's exactly right. you don't know what's going on on the top, pal. 
Yeah, like, that's why it's a jerk program. Because <laughs> you can only understand what this program does if you understand puns or if you have the source code. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the user doesn't have to worry. All the user gets is a request. And this naming of zero is setting up one of those boolean uh, boolean factors again, which is how they all work. Input goes out to the user. So input's going to go to the user and get the but he, he doesn't know that name was set to nothing and then while name is not. Right. It's just going to keep asking him until he types in your name. Yeah. Is yeah. this a fundamental so what's wrong with the program? Again, there's nothing wrong with the program. When someone asks you, what is your name? If I say, what is your name? What are you going to respond with? And who says that this is a stupid program? Right. <laughs> Why is that a good thing? Because if I ask you and I say, what is your name? What is your response? Ralph, what does that have to do with who going play with me for a second? All right. If you tell me your name is Ralph, and I say no, what is your name? So you say Ralph, and I say no, what is your name? And then you finally say, what do you need? And I say, this is what I want. I want you to write this. Your name. That means a literal thing to a computer. That's the worst thing right now. I apologize. The names of my elementary teachers. If I tell you to type in this, and I ask you that as a question, you're going to keep telling me your name. It means something different to you. Your name is Ross. But the computer wants you to type in this string. That's what you're missing, Peter. You're missing that when it says, when it says at the top, I, I feel like if I walk, I'm going to die. You, you can <laughs> wild, wild name is not equal to your name. That is a literal string. It's comparing the input you give it to the literal string, your name. It wants you to type in the string, your name, not your name. And as long as you're you typing in anything other than your name, it's going to keep going in. The That's right. Let's run it. Let me show you. Yeah. Peter, we're going to run this code. We're going to go run. We're going to go scratch. Please type in your name, Evan. Please type in your name, Evan. Please type in your name, Ralph. Please type in your name, Ralph. Now here's the catch. Please type in your name, your name. <laughs> That's actually probably because if one person asks, then people are thinking it, right? So uh, there we go. Yes, that's why it's a jerk program. Can okay. I, can I point out one slide? Like, name was not initialized to zero. It was not initialized to empty. It was initialized to a string variable. So like, if you, so somebody typed it like name equals five instead of name equal apostrophes, it would, right? No? No, never mind. Yeah. Forget I so, said okay. Can we edit that out? Would it help, <laughs> <laughs> would it help to remove the breakpoint and actually step through it with the debugger? It would, but we're not doing that now because we have literally 20 minutes and I want to con continue to cover this. Yes. But everyone understands what is going on. Yes. And, and we're going to cover debuggers in a later chapter. Uh, okay, so so here's the thing. How else can we, we structure this, right? Well, here's another thing. If we say while true, that loop is going to run forever, right? Let's come down here. If I say while true, let's get rid of that whole silliness, right? Now this piece of code is never going to stop, right? If I go run and then I say run and I say scratch, there's nothing I can type here that's going to get this to stop bothering me. Even if I say your name, it's not going to stop because this is always true. So how do you get it to stop, right? Python has a thing called break, and you can provide it inside the loop, and it says, okay, time to quit, let's get out of here. So if I put this down here, right, like this, and then we run this code, run, run. Yeah, so one time, the break. Please type your name, Evan, and we're done, because we broke out of there. Now this break can be in a conditional. You can say if something break, you can say whatever you want. But break means we're done looping. Exit the nearest loop, we're out of it, right? That's really all there is to break. Now we come down here and we see continue. Okay, so now we know about break. What does continue do? Well, if we look here, if I said something like this, please print your name, name equals input, right? And then I can say break, Let's say here, uh, counter equals counter plus one. Counter equals zero. If, we'll say here, name equals heaven. Okay, what is this code over here? If name. <laughs> Yeah, 
There we go. OK. What is this code going to do? Actually, I think with this, you could actually say, I'm trying to see what they're showing you. Yeah, OK. While true. OK. This code, right, is going to say, if the name is not equal to Evan, if your name is not equal to Evan, then continue. If your name is equal to Evan, increase the counter by one, right? And then what we can do is, every time you give me a different name that's not Evan, it's gonna loop back up to the top and it's never gonna count it. If you give me Evan, it's gonna get to the second condition and then loop back up to the top. So how would I make this thing end? Right, I can say this, if name equals Evan, continue. And then I can say, Now it's going to ask you your name twice, right? If you give it Evan, it's going to say OK, and it's going to increment the counter. And it's going to ask you again. If you give it Evan again, it's going to break. If not, the counter just gets incremented. So when we run this code, please type your name, Evan. The counter goes up. Bob. It restarts. Mm -hmm. If I say Bob, it doesn't increment the counter. If I say Evan, it increments the counter. If I type in Evan one more time, we're out. Right? So you could do something like this. The point of continue is whenever you see continue, you stop where you're at and you go back up to the top. Right? If you don't hit the continue, you keep going on. And what happens when you go on? It asks you again for your name. And if you give it the name again, it breaks. So if we look at their code, let's take their code and we're going to copy run it. Totally different example here. What's up in the back? You use continue equals continue plus one. If you had said continue equal to zero in the beginning, the Python assume continue starts at zero. The counter. The counter. Not, it was it was counter, not continue. I did use the oh, word sorry, continue, yeah, continue, but there was another word in there called counter. I'm sorry, I meant counter. I got that. Yeah. So Python, I started my counter at zero. I put that at the very top of the loop. What I'm saying is, if you did not do that. Would it Python assume that counter started at the value of zero? I think it I think it would actually error. I'm not hundred percent sure of that. It would error. Yes, it would error. It would error. Because you can't if you say something like this, right? If you say uh, if you don't define it and you say a uh, plus one, no, I already have a. Let me give you something else. Evan plus one, right like this, it's gonna come back and say error. Evan is not defined. You have to define your variable before you can use it. So you have to set it to something. So you set it to zero, and now you can say Evan plus one. If you don't define it first, you can't ever increment it. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't simply not run. Okay, so we have this one here. This is another while loop. What are we doing here? Who wants help reason about this? Next step, Pearl. You want to give it a shot? Uh, <clears throat> what's the question? Help me reason about this code. Tell me what it's doing. Before we run it. So the while true does what? Sorry, you count the while I was. Uh, no problem. You want to give it a shot? What does while true do? It just enters the loop. It enters the loop, and how long does it loop for? Infinite. An infinite. It enters an infinite loop. That's beautiful. Uh, what's your name? Mironi. Mironi. Veroni. 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 You want to help me help, help me out? Tell me. Okay. So now we're in a loop. It's an infinite loop. What's happening? Um. So it prints out how are you? Prints out how who, who are, are you? And then who are you? Sorry. And then the um, it asks for I guess the name. That's exactly right. And in the name. Right? Um, and if the name is equal to Joe, then what happens? If the name is equal to Joe, then it's going to print hello Joe as the password. Exactly. Else. And then it, um, uh, you input the password. And then if the password equals to swordfish, it prays and it goes up the loop. That's exactly right. 
That's exactly right. Breaks out and says access granted. Exactly, 100%. Nailed it. Very good. Awesome. So that's that's it. So who are you? You give it a name. If your name is Joe, it asks you for your password. If you get the password right, it breaks out and you're granted. There's a case where you have a continue and a break inside of a while loop. You don't typically see this kind of stuff. Right? Normally you see one or the other. You don't normally see while loops with continues and breaks, and you're going to see reasons for that later. Uh, but nonetheless, they show them off. Okay, so. Yes? For that example, if the password wasn't swordfish, where would it jump back to? If the password wasn't swordfish, yeah. then what would happen is you would. That's Give it the good. trouble loop, right? It would end the loop, and it would still print out access as granted because the code is actually no, wrong. no, the, the, the no, 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 no. That's the end of the while loop, the block. Yeah, so it's just back. Tell me, start all over. Oh, oh, that's the end. What? Wait, oh, wait what? Yeah, it was the the block, the while loop block. Yeah. That's the end of it, and you're doing while true. So it's just going to iterate again. You don't get to break if you don't have if if you're if. With the password is not true, you don't get to break. You go back up. If if with the password is not okay, yes, there you go. That's what's happening. That's the condition. Yeah. If, yeah. It's false. if the password isn't true, right? If you don't get the password right, then what actually happens is you don't break out of the loop. So the whole thing starts over. And rather than it just simply asking you for your password, it asks you again for what your name is. That's what's happening. So this is actually supposedly should go down. And this is Kind of awkward in my opinion, but yes, that's what's happening. It so would make more sense to write down access granted and not just break out of the sleep ever, right? Yeah, so it's confusing, but if you were to add yeah. uh, line 10 while well, password and then once, right. then maybe that would kind of show the control. Well, I was just thinking this is effectively the same thing as this, right? You could come up here, you could move this access granted up, but just show this off. You could say this, and then you could say break. And it's the same thing right there, right? Well, yeah. If password equals swordfish, print access granted break. That just seems simpler. But well, yes. It's simpler, but it's not illustrated the point. Yeah, the point is, I agree. The point is that if you put the break here, then what actually is going to happen is if the password equals swordfish, you break out of the loop. If you if the password is not equal to swordfish, then you simply continue. You do what would otherwise not be there. If this wasn't there at all, you would just restart this loop and keep looping. And because this is there, you have an out, but only if that's true. Okay. So, I don't know that we're gonna, Ed, give me advice here. Do you wanna, you want me to cut this off or do you wanna start off next week on this chapter? Not here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, well we're gonna keep rocking that. <laughs> He's next door. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop off in this, and then we'll just start next week with, because we did breaks, we did continues, but there's still more to go. There's an equivalent while loop, they're going to show how to construct them. And we're going to start off next week on that. So there are, there are like five problems, but they're very close. If you want to try these practice questions, I think that's a good idea. And then we will review them next week in class. Ed will pick up the class. He'll cover rewriting the while loop, and then we'll go into those practice examples.